broadcasting from the spooky south coast and around the world on Midnight FM. This is Midnight Society. I am your host, Tim Weisberg. Whether it is the brightest of day or the darkest of night, wherever you may be, it's time to hunker down for the next three hours as we enter into a world of wonder and weird that you won't hear anywhere else. And I know I say that each and every night, but tonight... It'll be a night of weird unlike any other because tonight we have really some of the most impressive musicians around. Uh, We have the gentleman who play with the weird one himself, the legendary Weird Al Yankovic. But let me tell you, this band is incredible. I have seen them perform and I don't know if there is another band that can do the kind of things that these guys do. And we're going to get to hear all the inside stories. Our main guest is John Bermuda Schwartz. He is the longtime drummer for Weird Al. He also has a new book out that we'll be discussing about not only Weird Al, but being out on the road with him uh, and all of that and some of his fine, fine photography. So we'll talk about that. We'll also talk with them about their music, both with Weird Al and separately. You know, this is a, a, an opportunity to really hear some of these stories and get inside the way that all this works because you know it's a lot of fun when you're going to see the shows and you're listening to the music but there's a lot of work that goes into the fun so we're going to find out about about all of that as well as get the inside stories and uh the very excited because this is hugely influential for me the music of these gentlemen has been a big big part of my life i wrote about it today in the newsletter for the paranormal radio app it is called the telepath and if you subscribe to that you'll be able to uh, read my article i'll share it out on social media too as well but uh, if you don't have the paranormal radio app i highly recommend downloading it because it allows you to listen to midnight fm not just this program midnight society but all of the programming that we have right there on your device wherever you are uh, and you can listen to you know, the the website, of course, midnight.fm. You can listen to that directly on your phone as well. But the Paranormal Radio app uh, also gives you a lot of other programs that you can listen to as well. Not that you'd ever really want to turn it from Midnight FM, but if you ever want to hear some classic Art Bell or maybe some of our other friends' programs across the paranormal spectrum, it's all right there. So you can check that out and sign up for the newsletter, and you'll be able to read my column each week. And my column this week deals with you know, the, the day that I stood in the Bradley's of the Westgate Mall, uh, and I don't even know if Bradley's was a national chain or if it was a regional chain, but some of you might know what I'm talking about, standing there in the cassette tape section. And I have in one hand the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper, and I have in my other hand Weird Al's Even Worse. And I was a fan of both. I had, you know, a lot of uh, experience listening to both, but I only had $10 in my pocket, so I was only walking out with one. And I chose even worse, and it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Not just because my aunt dubbed Sgt. Pepper for me later that night when I told her, but also because it started me on this path of knowing that it's okay to be weird, and it's okay to have fun, and it's okay to not take yourself too seriously, but also to be serious about not taking yourself too seriously. So we'll get into all of that now, and I'm not going to waste any more time. John Bermuda Schwartz is a drummer best known for working with singer-songwriter Weird Al Yankovic. The two met while recording Another One Rides the Bus at the Dr. Demento Show on September 14th, 1980. We're going to find out all about that and more. Please welcome to the program, John Bermuda Schwartz. Hello, John. How are you? Hi, Tim. I'm, I'm very good. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so pleased you're a fan of the music. Uh, I'm a fan of your music as well. Uh, I've got the uh, Twin Sons LP. A uh, uh, big fan of that, you know, with Dan Fogelberg. That must have been very cool working with him. Oh, oh um, yeah, oh yeah. The my my all time favorite Tim Weisberg album though has to be Tip of the Weisberg, just because there's so many jokes I can make with that. Ah, uh, oh, you're you're not that Tim. Not the same guy. Although we do both oh. have, uh, you know, we bo- do both have uh, prodigious experience in playing the flute. Actually, no, oh. I've never played okay. the flute in my life. <laughs> Oh well, well then, uh, well then, this will be a very different interview tonight. Okay, uh, no, thank I, I, I know, I know. No, thank you for having me. That's good to be here. Well, I was so excited when when you agreed to come on. Uh, you know, I saw that the book was coming out. Uh, I know was it originally scheduled for today? 
Uh, today was the day, and and some new pro, uh, COVID protocols came into place about uh, three, four weeks ago. And just to be safe, they delayed the release by three weeks to November 17th. But, of course, the book showed up pretty much on time anyway. So uh, it's starting to get out there. Uh, I believe Amazon has uh, shipped some of their orders already. And uh, there was a special edition as well, and that shipped uh, on time. And the people that got that are just are really thrilled. I haven't even seen one yet. I won't see one until tomorrow. But uh, some of the fans have already received theirs, and they're just they're raving about them. They, they love it. So, I mean, that's always a fortunate thing when, uh, when the, the shipping works out and, and the release works out as, as it does, especially since I know that in 27 is a number that has some significance uh, in, in the Weird Al Pantheon. That's that's uh, Al's magic number, and I don't know if he decided it was magic or the fans just started seeing a lot of twenty seven references, and they decided that was the number. But it's his number. There's there's no getting around it now. So yes, we deliberately chose the twenty seventh, and would have been great to to make sure this was the day, and didn't quite work out. And he just celebrated a birthday last week too, right? Uh, on his birthday is October twenty third, and he just turned uh, sixty one. Well, I mean, you would never know it because, you know, the, the type of uh, fun that you guys all get to have, I'm sure it keeps you young. Well, definitely. And and that's the most important thing about this gig is it's fun. You know, we just, I mean, we enjoy playing on stage and playing the music and all that, but we have a good time. All of us, Al, you know, and it's, it's not when you're having fun, it's not like work. You know, it's like, it's like you're having fun, you know, and you get paid to have fun uh, and it's great. And the fans are great. They just, they keep coming to see us and. You know, even these last few tours without the benefit of a new album or really any new songs, uh, they're still there for us more than ever before. I mean, it's just, it's great. Yeah, it's I mean, been great. It seems to be a different, a different release style now where instead of putting out whole albums, you know, Al just seems to be putting out things that come to him as they come to him and not so worried about the traditional methods anymore. Well, that's been the plan. Uh, we haven't really, you know, we have recorded a couple of things. Uh, under Al's name, kind of, there were a couple of remixes of Portugal the Man songs uh, that uh, that we worked on. So it doesn't really qualify as an Al song per se. And the Hamilton polka uh, was certainly performed by all of us, you know, and, and sung by Al, although he didn't write that. So that was pretty cool. But that's been uh, coming up on three years in uh, February since we recorded that. And but the the premise of not being with the label anymore is that uh, we can go ahead and record a song and and literally have it out in in a few days or even a week. And you get to to interact and talk directly with the fans instead of having to go through you know all of the other you know red tape and bureaucracy associated with music. You, you, and it seems like the band has a very very strong connection with the fandom. Oh, definitely, uh, and that's. That's partly because, uh, you know, we, we started out playing clubs back in 1983, actually 1982. And, and uh, you know, we got to know the fans and they got to know us. And, and we're easy. You know, Al's really great with the fans. I mean, he's not a snooty rock star or anything like that. He's a very nice rock star. And, uh, you know, the, the fans have been great. I mean, honestly, we, we couldn't and probably would not do this if the fans weren't there for us. You know, so we love them. It's all about the fans. Well, and the name of the book, the full name of the book is Black and White and Weird All Over, The Lost Photographs of Weird Al Yankovic, 83 to 86. And these photographs, you, you didn't just curate a bunch of photographs into this book. You took these photos. I took every one of those photos, unless I'm in the photo. And I figured out who I handed my camera to for those photos. Uh, that was musical Mike Kiefer. He's the guy that did the hand squawks. The, he's a manualist. And he did all that hand music on uh, Al's records. And he's been on stage with us a few times. He's been in, in fact, he's in the I Love Rocky Road video. And I originally was going to try to not put any pictures of me in there at all. I really wanted the book to be just pictures that I took. And there were some pictures in there that were so good. And I don't mean because I was in them, but you know, if Al or something was going on in the picture, I really couldn't not use it just because I wanted to, you know, not be in the book. So we went ahead and, and did that. And uh, the publisher then went ahead and chose a few others of me. Like there's one full page picture of me sitting, eating uh, an ice cream sundae. You know, that was not a picture I chose to be in there necessarily. But as long as I was going to be in the book, we he thought, you know, why not? Let's put them in there. It's funny. As soon as you mentioned the hand squawks, the first thing that popped into my head was I love Rocky Road. Right. And, and uh, Musical Mike is in there. And the way I know it's Musical Mike, not only, you know, I figured it was him and he pretty much confirmed it. I asked several other people and they said, no, pretty sure it wasn't me. But the fact that Mike and I are not in any photos together was a pretty good clue that either one or the other of us had the camera at all times. So that's, that's how we determined it was him. So uh, w was photography something that you had been into your entire life? Well, I got into it when I was uh, in high school. 
And I bought uh, the camera from a friend in a band I was in and set up a dark room at home. Uh, we had, uh, had a very nice house, had five bathrooms in the house. So one of the bathrooms became my dark room and, uh, I could develop film. I, I loaded my own film. I bought film in hundred foot, hundred foot rolls and little canisters. And you just load them up. And, uh, as you need it, it was very economical and, uh, printed and developed in the whole thing. I didn't do color. I only did black and white in the very beginning. And, you know, I did shoot color eventually. And when I met Al, I began shooting color. And the first time I shot black and white with Al was the first pictures you see in, in the book in chapter one, which is Ricky. So that was April, 1983. And I also shot black and white on that video, but, but the black, I'm sorry, I also shot color, but the black and white shots, only a couple of those had ever been seen. And the same for the I Love Rocky Road video. Uh, none of the rest of the photos in the book had ever been seen. I mean, Al had never even seen them. And I really hadn't seen them until I reexamined the contact sheets. They were never printed, nothing. They were just made contact sheets and put in a file folder and put away all these years. So, you know, I had the photography bug early, but, you know, I didn't really... I didn't shoot black and white with Al until that time. And I think I thought that it would be really cool. That was our first video, Ricky. And I thought it would be cool to, you know, that black and white is kind of a documentation sort of a, a vibe. And I thought that would be cool to have that. And they do have a certain vibe. I mean, you know, when you look at a book full of black and white photos, it takes you back to a different era, not the 50s, but it takes you back to, you know, it makes you feel like it's a retro thing. And it just, it has a certain vibe and the fans hadn't seen any, but you know, maybe about 10 or 12 of the photos in the book, they haven't seen any of these photos before. Well, and what's, so that's, that's part of what makes the book special. And, and it, and it, and it chronicles, you know, talking about it being from 1983 to 1986, it really chronicles Al and the, and the band's rise to prominence and from being just, you know, what could have been a, a jokey one-off kind of novelty act to actually becoming, you know, legitimate musical superstars. Uh, Yeah. Well, we didn't see it coming. We had just, you know, it happened and kept happening and got bigger and bigger, you know, over the years and over the decades and, and you know, which has been incredible. And again, I, I thank the fans for that. If the fans weren't there to come see us play and to buy the cassettes and, and CDs and albums, uh, you know, none of this would be, you know, we wouldn't be talking about this or we would have been talking about it 35 years ago, you know, as a one hit wonder. Uh, but yeah, in documenting that stuff, you know, I was the only one around with a camera. We really didn't have an onset photographer. Uh, you know, people back in the eighties didn't have a phone on them that would take pictures. You know, they didn't carry on cameras. I was just always the guy with the camera and Al and everyone else around, like on the video sets, the directors and the, you know, the, the crew and stuff, they were very good about letting me take pictures. Uh, you know, one, I kind of stayed out of everyone's way, you know, and, and I was able to document those things in a way that no one else could. I mean, nobody else had a camera, so there are no other pictures from those video shoots than the ones I have, and, and a lot of the early days in the studio, and a lot of the uh, days on the road. But these are the, the book is filled with only the black and white shots that I took, and and that's what's special about the book. And that's just that period of time. There are no black and white shots from 1987. Let's say it, it ended in '86 with the Living with the Hernia video, and and that was the end of it. And then I just shot color from then on. So just talk to us a little bit about the, the vibe of those of those days of, of what it was like, you know, getting to play this music and, and, and to basically be paid to have fun. I mean, I know, I know that there was work involved in it, but it, it had to have been something that was, you know, greatly uh, rewarding to you to be able to do something that brought so much joy to people. Well, absolutely. I mean, you know, we'd all not Al, but we'd all been sort of in local bands and bar bands and stuff like that. And Jim and Steve write their own music and Ruben writes his own music. And, and, you know, we'd all had other musical experiences, but never on the level that, that it became with Al. And that started off pretty quick. I mean, uh, uh videos were new at the time. MTV started in 1981 and, uh, Ricky was shot in 1983. Uh, MTV was very hungry for videos. So Ricky got a lot of play. Uh, I love Rocky road. Got a lot of play. Eat it. Got a lot of play. Uh, like a surgeon got a lot of play, et cetera, et cetera. And, and it was very cool to be part of that, to, to kind of grow with it. Uh, to, not only in the size of the gigs and the type of the gigs we were doing, uh, you know, as we began to sell more records and get gold and then platinum albums, that was a very cool recognition factor. Uh, it's just, it's very cool to do what you like doing and know that people like it. And, and, uh, it's nice to be able to make a living at it as well, of course. So uh and it seems like, you know, at least from a fan's perspective, it seems like for the the Weird Al experience for all of you together that it, it started really coming together pretty quickly. Uh, well, it had all the trappings of, of uh, 
a famous group. I mean, we had videos and we were doing tours and we had albums on a fairly regular basis, 83, 84, 85, 86, 88, 89. Um, you know, there haven't been too many gaps between albums for some time. Um, yeah, it just, it, uh, it was just so cool kind of, kind of growing with it and, and watching it develop. And it did happen pretty fast and it, it got big and it stayed big and it got bigger and it's just, it just, even now it, it keeps growing. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. You know, it's kind of a grateful dead sort of a thing, or maybe fish or one of these bands that goes out without the benefit of new product and they go out and, and they have a following and they play to these massive crowds, you know, and they're bigger now than they ever were in the very beginning. And it's just, and it's kind of that way, you know, not, not that many people with Al, but, and not that much pot going around in the audience, but you know, it's just, it's that kind of a thing where it just got really big and, and it's been very, very cool. So I, th- I think most Weird Al fans know, you know, the, the the legend kind of began thanks to, to you know, Dr. Demento spinning some of these records and, uh, and starting off, of course, with with my Bologna. But how did you get involved with Al? Because it, it, it it's a very interesting story and it ties into one of the one of the greatest parodies of all time. Well, there's a story behind the story, behind the story, behind the man, behind the accordion case, behind the man, behind the accordion. Uh, I, I, in the seventies, like Al, uh, I sent in homemade music to Dr. Demento. Now these weren't parodies or, or original songs even, but some of my bandmates and I, it started with a contest in 1973 that Dr. Demento ran to send in a homemade version of a song that was very popular on his show, Pico and Sepulveda. And, uh, there's a tie in with that in a second that I'll tell you. So we recorded, uh, a song. I had some, uh, I had, uh, Richard Elliott was on sax on that famous sax player. Uh, Jeff Rona played flute. Jeff uh, Jeff was one of the guys in the early '80s that worked for Roland and invented MIDI. So he's he's pretty amazing. Wow. Uh, he uh, and he's the guy that sold me the camera. I might add, it was a Minolta SRT 101 35 millimeter camera. He's the guy that sold me that camera. I was in a band with him. Anyway, we sent this recording of Pico and Sepulveda in. Uh, it came in second place out of over a hundred entries. And I didn't know, you know, back in those days, you know, Dr. Demento didn't really say anything to anybody. You know, I, I listened to the show to find out if we were going to be played at all. And I heard it come up in the second place spot. And it was just, it was incredible. And he actually used it for his theme for a while because we did uh, pretty much an instrumental. We sang the intro, which is, and I'm not a singer, but it was Pico and Sepulveda, Pico and Sepulveda, Pico. And, you know, it does that a little bit. And then it comes in with a nice kind of a rumba vibe. And, and we just did it as an instrumental. So Demento would uh, would use that as his theme song because he could talk over it, you know, introducing that night's show. So that was kind of cool, too. Now, I said there was another tie-in. Uh, Al also sent in uh, a, a recording of, of him and some friends doing Pico and Sepulveda. That would have been the very first thing that he sent to Dr. Demento. Uh, the bad news is uh, he, he gave Dr. De- Dr. Demento did a, a talk at Al's High School, Linwood High. This would have been maybe March or April of 1973. And uh, Al handed him his entry for P- the Pico and Sepulveda contest. And Dr. Demento didn't have the heart to tell him he'd missed the deadline. So uh, Dr. Demento put it in the trunk of his car, uh, forgot about it. Short time later, sold the car with the tape in there. And it's gone forever. So uh, Al doesn't have a copy or he says he doesn't have a copy. And uh, I've never heard it, and uh, I don't think Dr. Demento ever heard it, and it's just, it's gone forever. But Al and I basically entered the the Dr. Demento thing around the same time. Now, with some of these people I did Pico and Sepulveda with, we recorded another song and sent that in. It was the ballad of Woodsy Owl, uh, the anti-pollution owl, give a hoot, don't pollute. And Dr. Demento played that on the air. And uh, about a year later, we sent in another thing, Mr. Ghost Goes to Town. And he played that on the air. In fact, once in a while, it still gets played on his Halloween show. So we had sent some stuff in, and then that was kind of the end of it. In the meantime, Al was beginning to send in his uh, homemade parodies and some original songs, and he was starting to get better known on the show. Uh, In 1980, I was invited down to the show by Dr. Demento to do an interview about being one of the first people to have homemade music played on his show. You know, by 1980, the show pretty much catered to independent artists and a lot of people making music in their homes. And, and uh, you know, Al, of course, was very well known on the show. He'd already done My Bologna by that time. That was December of 1979 that that came out. So I was there September 14th, 1980, and went down there. I knew who Al was. Um, 
And and during the course of the show, and I did my interview, which I have a copy of it, and it makes me cringe. I was not very radio worthy at the time, and and was pro- I, was, I was probably just scared. I probably had stage fright because the show was live at that time, Sunday nights. And uh, Al was going to debut live on the air a song he had written that weekend. He had been out camping with some friends, uh, Beefalo Bill Burke and Doctor Demento, and uh, he was going to play this new song. So he asked, uh, he actually asked Beefalo Bill if he would beat on his accordion case to do this uh, parody of Another One Bites the Dust called Another One Rides the Bus. And I don't, I think Bill was kind of hesitant about it and, and, you know, I guess had asked me, you know, by this time they knew I was a drummer, had asked me if I would do it instead. And I said, uh, uh, sure, why not? You know, and I told Al and we ran through it a few times and uh, did it on the air. Thankfully, Dr. Demento was rolling tape and that became a single. And in fact, that tape ended up on the album. We didn't re-record that. That was the recording of me and Al and, and uh, Damascus and uh, Musical Mike was in the background, just doing all some arts of you know noises and singing the chorus and me beating on his accordion case. So after we were done, I said, you know that's you know that's a lot of fun. You should have a band. I'll be your drummer. And and now we're on the internet, you know, talking to millions of people. It's great. <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't realize that Damascus was there when that was recorded. Uh, he was. He he was on that. Uh, uh, there's a couple. Of, I can't remember all of the people that were on there. Uh, Sulu was in the background. I think uh, it was basically whoever was in the cast. You know, it was all. It was a very tight knit group. You know, everyone was friendly. If one person had a song, everyone else sang or made noises or clapped on it or whatever. And uh, you know, like when Damascus would do something, sometimes Al would be singing in the background. Or same for Sulu. And, and vice versa when Al was doing uh, his things live. So this was just was not intended to be anything other than him just playing a song. And again, thankfully, Dr. Demento had a tape of it and it became very, very popular. And uh, it it broke Al in a way that even my Bologna had not. Al was pretty well known on the doc. He was very well known on the Dr. Demento show, but not so much outside of that. Well, when another one rides the bus made it two or three weeks later to Dr. Demento's syndicated show now it's now it's being heard on like 200 stations uh, across the country on uh, usually on sunday night now for a lot of the morning zoo wacky zoo guys you know monday through friday drive time guys you know want to play funny songs or whatever uh they would for those stations that ran the dr demento show they would listen to the show from the night before to see if there's anything crazy on there that they could take off and play and that next monday morning after uh, after bus was on the national show, it started showing up like in morning drive time, which is golden. So now Al's getting heard to a whole new audience, and uh, it and things really began to to snowball from there. I mean, in a way that they, you know, yes, Al had a deal on Capital for My Bologna, but this became even bigger than that. And uh, and, and it was it was Al got himself a manager, and uh, you know he was still wrapping up school. He says uh, when I come back in January, this is January of nineteen eighty one coming up he says i want to record a few more songs and we'll put another one rides the bus on there and we'll put on an ep and and see what happens and uh we did and and it just it kind of went from there we were on the tomorrow show a couple of months later um started doing some gigs around town put together a band got a got a deal to go in and record an album on uh, spec and uh that began, that was the first album we recorded it at cherokee which is a famous studio in hollywood and uh, al's manager shopped it around and the line is that uh, all the record labels said, boy, someone's going to make a million bucks with this, just not us. <laughs> and then finally, uh, the Scotty brothers, uh, who had had Survivor at the time and, and a few other, Felony was a local uh, uh, a new wave band that they had on their label. They had some other reissue and, and compilation stuff going on. Uh, they took Al. They were distributed by uh, CBS, actually by Epic Portrait Associate, Associated Labels. And... Uh, they took on Al, and uh, we put out an album with a couple of new tracks, Ricky and, oh, uh, I think the Buckingham Blues were recorded fresh for that album so that, uh, you know, Ricky would be current parody of Tony Basil's Mickey. And that came out, I think, in uh, April April or May of 1983. Uh, we did a little tour with Dr. Demento. Uh, the band by this time was already together, Steve J on bass, Jim West on guitar. And uh, that's been the band ever since. We've had a couple of keyboard players rotate through, but uh, Ruben uh, has been with us since uh, he did his first gig with us in 1991. And uh, 
we we can't uh, we can't shake him. We can't get rid of him. We tried, <laughs> and we tried not paying him, and he still he still hangs around. So, I mean, I can only imagine what the reaction must have been uh, from people that heard that first album. I mean, there's there's not only is it you know rich in in some really great parodies, but it also has some some fantastic originals. I don't think I've ever heard anything like Mr. Frump and his iron lung before. And uh, I don't think I've ever heard anything like it since. Uh, yeah. You know what? We, we, we played that very early on. I'm not even sure the entire band played that very much, but we brought it back when we did this tour a couple of years ago, the, uh, well, we just call it the no frills tour where Al trotted out like 50 of the original songs that we had done. And every night we would play 15, 16, 17 of them and rotate different songs throughout the night so the fans never knew what was coming up. And uh, Mr. Frump was one of the songs that we played uh, throughout there. And uh, and that was an early song also that Al sent in. I don't know if it dates back to 1976 or 77, but that was one of the songs that he had a bedroom recording of, basically, and, and uh, Dr. Demento played it. So that was, you know, and I think Al had been on the air a few times and played it live on the air. And, and that uh, album, you got to work with Rick Derringer on that album, right? That, yeah, you know what? That was extremely cool. Well, here's how Rick came into the picture. Uh, when when uh, Al had written a song called I Love Rocky Road, which is a parody of Joan Jett's I Love Rock and Roll, which is actually a cover of another song, and I cannot think of the band's name, but uh, there was another song that did I Love Rock and Roll not too long before that, uh, but Joan had the hit of it. So Al was, was uh, seeking permission so that, he could record it properly and, and uh, you know, have Dr. Demento play it. And in seeking permission, he talked to one of the writers, a guy named Jake Hooker, and uh, who was in the band that did this. I, I cannot think of the name of the band. Sorry. And uh, Jake gave him permission and, and said, uh, you know, and, and he helped he helped get a, a record, not a record deal, but he helped get studio time. He says, and one of my clients, Rick Derringer, will have him produce it. And Al says, yeah, okay, sure, great, cool. So that's how that's how we got the studio time, and that's how Rick got involved. Jim West wasn't quite quite up to speed yet with us. I'm not even sure we met him by the time we did the first album, by the time we recorded most of those tracks. So Rick did all the guitar. That was me, Rick, Steve J on bass, Al on accordion. That album is also unique because the parodies, there was very little effort to make them sound like the original song, like like we did starting with the second album, and we got very, very good at that later on. But the first album, there's no attempt, you know, well, you know, uh, Ricky, you know, with accordion all over it and stuff like that. You know, you don't, it, it didn't sound very much like Mickey. Um, Stop Dragging My Car Around didn't sound very much like Stop Dragging My Heart Around. You know, it's very accordion-based stuff, because that's just what we did. And that was another unique thing. I mean, who who... Who does funny songs with an accordion? Well, perhaps everyone does. I don't know. But by the second album, Rick says, you know what? Let's let's make the songs really sound like the original song in the case of the parodies. Uh, and that'll, that way they'll hear the beginning of the song, like Eat It, for example. You hear the beginning of, of Eat It and they hear, the, sorry, hear the beginning of Beat It. And it's hard to tell which one is which. They sound very, very close. Now, once we get into it, of course, once you hear the lyrics, you know you're not listening to Michael. You know, you know it's Al's song. And looking back, you know, 37 years now, 36 years, uh, Beat It didn't sound quite that close to Eat It. You know, it was okay. Uh, we, like I said, we got really good at that much later on. And once things, once we got into programming and sound design and there were a lot of keyboard-based things, it was very easy to cop the sounds that a lot of these original records has had. And uh, Al got very good at producing. We got very good at producing and, and sound design and all of that. And we got really, really scary close to these original songs uh, that, that we were playing. And uh, and we try and replicate that live as well. I mean, I remember, you know, always being a fan of, of just how good and how close it did sound to the original. But it was, I think it was um, Smells Like Nirvana where I said, I think these guys could play anything. <laughs> Well, we have been called the the greatest cover band in the world. I think uh, I don't know if BBC said that about us, but and and that's very cool. And and it's it's fun doing that, and it's fun to learn how to do that. I mean, we've all learned a lot. We've we've grown a lot as players and and as you know, kind of as producers and as sound designers. You know, I, I do a lot of programming. Uh, the last album, all of the parodies were programmed, and uh, it's not just you know you don't just buy a machine and punch out a bunch of rhythms and and you, you make the song, you got to work on sounds. 
and uh, you know certain little nuances. And and you know I, I got to be a very good listener. Well, we all did. You know, we all grew as players and programmers and musicians, uh, as did Al. You know, and, and we had to because you know the real life producers out there doing cutting edge stuff with cutting edge artists. You know, we're we're really we're cutting edge, you know, and so we're always chasing that and always having to learn how to do that. Or if we didn't know how to do it, we learned how to sound like, you know, make it sound like we had done it. And, uh, and that's part of the success also, you know, part, part of the joke is, is that the song, and we've been accused more than a few times of getting a hold of the original tracks and Al just singing over it, which is a great compliment. But not true. Not true in the least. Not not true. And but we didn't feel bad about it. It's you know oh, we worked so hard, and you think he just borrowed the track? It's like, wow, we worked so hard, and it paid off. That's cool. We love that. Well, what I also love about the originals is that even though they're original songs, they always seem to be par- parodying, par- taking off on a certain style. <laughs> And, uh, and, and so, you know, you'll get everything from a doo-wop song to, uh, you know, a 1970s singer songwriter vibe to, you know, talk, I mean, um, one, you know, just you, you'd hear it and you'd be like, that sounds like it's from, you know, talking heads and, but it's not, and, and it's not a talking head song, but you would think that it is if you didn't know any better. Well, and that's, that's part of the thing too, of, of that's what part of what makes those songs fun. Now, some songs are completely Al original things and, and meaning you can't really tell what style it is. It's pure Al, but other things are, are sort of based on the vibe of a lot of his favorite groups, you know, or maybe a group that's popular and he, he, uh, didn't want to do a straight parody of it, but you know, would do an original in that style. And I think it was, uh, a, a fan that came up with the term style parody way back and, and, uh, you know, I, I think we we now call it an homage, or there's there's a few other, you know, a tribute or whatever. But you know, we do do things, and and there's a fine line there as well. You know, we if, if Al says, well, we're doing a song in the style of uh, Doors, you know, like Craigslist was a very much a Doors sounding thing, and you could say, well, there's sort of that sounds like it could be, you know, uh, not L.A. Woman. I'm tr- I can't think of the songs that we sort of thought about when we played that, but it, it means getting into those guys' heads. Now, not for the keyboard player, because we had Ray Manzarek play on that. So, but the instruction being, you know, this is don't play what you played in the doors, but but play to make it sound as if the doors had done that. You know, and that's that's how I approached the drums. That's how I approached Don John Densmore's uh, vibe was if he had been called into the session, what would he play? You know, without just duplicating some of the stuff he did with the doors. You know, what what would he sound like if he did that? And I had to be. John Densmore, you know, I have to be Roger Taylor from Queen, you know, I get to be all of these drummers and, and that's a learning experience too. You know, when I'm playing parts, uh, you know, it's, it's fun to do those things. I get to be Hal Blaine. I get to be, uh, Dave Grohl in Nirvana, you know, and, and another song we did that was a style parody of Nirvana that, uh, uh, Colin and sick, you know, was very much one of their sort of rock ballad things, you know, so I got to imagine if, if Dave was called in on that session and told, you know, sound like you do with Nirvana, but you know, it's not a Nirvana song. You know, I had to play those parts, you know, I had to make up those kind of things. So it was very cool getting inside these drummers heads. But it's a, it's an overall performance. It's not just the recording. It's even not just playing it on tour. You know, you have to become part of the video. You have to become part of the stage performance of it. So, I mean, all, everybody in the band is multi-talented in the way that you are part of this complete, uh, you know, musical and visual package. Well, it's a great band. I mean, th- th- these are top-notch players, and uh, it, it's just uh, everyone's at the top of their game, and everyone's a good sport. And this is where the fun comes in. You know, Al's not the only guy that dresses up uh, in the videos or on stage. You know, there's costumes tailored for all of us. There's wigs, there's hats, there's all sorts of stuff going on. And uh, uh, that that's part of the fun. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a, it's almost like a Broadway show. I mean, it's just, you know, with, with different costumes and rock music and then films that happen between some of the songs where we're changing costumes, it's, it's a nonstop show. In fact, it's billed as a rock and comedy, I'm sorry, a multimedia rock and, it's a rock and, co- well, that's a big show. No, something, a, a rock and comedy <laughs> multimedia extravaganza, something like that. And it's nonstop for 90 minutes or two hours or whatever it is. There's always something going on. And the audience loves it all. Nobody ever walked out of a show saying, that sucks. Uh, everyone's, you know, people are brought into our shows for the first time. Even now we have new fans, little kids, six and eight year old kids and 
a lot of our fans from 30, 35 years ago still come to the shows. And, uh, and so when they bring new people in, you know, we get new fans. I mean, the fan base is actually growing again, without the benefit of a new album in, in now six years. Well, and, and I think a lot of people who become Weird Al fans, and this happened for me in a lot of the, the songs that were coming out on those albums in the 80s, you became a fan of the songs that were being parried, parroted, the songs that were being poked fun at, uh, by having you know the, the Weird Al version, and then you're like, well, I wonder what the original version is of that. And then you go back and find it, and you're like, oh, I, I, I like that too. You know, like So, I mean, I remember being... I don't know, maybe like nine or 10 or whatever. And I found out about Devo because of weird Al. Oh, cool. I, I honestly, I've learned about a lot of songs going back and, and having to listen to them. I mean, obviously when we're doing a parody of something, we have to listen to it. But in many cases, that's the first time I've heard the song. I think honestly on, on this last album, a mandatory fun from 2014, I think I, I might've been familiar with word crimes with the uh, blurred lines rather and that was probably the only song that we parodied that I'd actually really heard. And and it was cool to like hear this other stuff. So, I mean, Al has actually introduced me, and I'm sure the other guys, to a lot of new music you know, that we, we may not have uh, otherwise listened to. I mean, there have been some cases where we would parody something, and, and I, would, I would like the uh, original song, and I would go out and get that artist's albums when they stood out, still had albums. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I, I've been turned on to a lot of new music uh, as a result of just, be, of just working for Al. You know, he's opened up my musical horizons uh, quite a bit. Not because he had to, not because I have to play him, but because I enjoy it. But he, he seems to really stay, you know, uh, right tied into current pop music. Well, it helps to parody songs that, that are popular. I mean, so people know what the gag is. You know, if you parody something that nobody knows, uh, it's, well, they might think it's an original song, but they don't know perhaps why it's funny. They don't know what the gag is. They don't know when they see a video that's stylized after the original song's video in some cases, you know, why that stuff is funny. If they haven't heard the song or seen the, the original video, then, then they, they're probably not in on the joke. They eventually will. I mean, and of course, you know, now it's, it's extremely easy to track down a song. Oh, that was a parody of that group. I, I don't remember the song, but I'll go look it up on YouTube, let's say. And they can see a video and hear the song, and then they get why Al's version is is so funny if it's not already funny on its own it becomes funnier once they know the original i mean for people who have never heard weird al music uh, and and there may be a few people listening probably not many but i would say the genius of it is in not only how much the music is dead on but the the lyrics are dead on because in a way they're kind of taking some of the original a lot of the times and twisting it into whatever story Al is trying to tell, whether it be about TV or food or what have you. But he always finds a way to have these little callbacks, even in the lyrics that go back to the original songs. And and, and that's just a, a level of parody genius that I think goes beyond what we've seen from, you know, the, the, the Stan Freebergs of the world and, and, and the people who were mocking popular songs of the time uh, in, in the era before the Weird Al band. Well, this is, I mean, Al is very crafty and i mean he's a craftsman not that he's he's sly but he's very he's he it's his craft it's an art to do to work in the lyric the rhythmics uh the rhyming things like that and there are references to to uh you know a, a lyrics in the original song you know or the idea of a lyric but he he's very careful about making sure that it all lines up to where you know, if you put the original lyrics with his lyrics, you know, the original vocal part with his, you know, they would, the inflections would be the same. The timing would be the same. The the rhyming words would be the same. And again, that's part of what makes it funny is it's, that's part of what makes it such a cool takeoff on the original is it really messes with it. You know, it really, it's not just some wild off the wall thing. It really digs into it and grabs hold of it, except all the lyrics are different. And if you are somebody who is a fan of music, then you have to be a fan of, you know, when, when music can rise to that other level. And, and I, I know that for the most part, artists have always kind of appreciated getting the, the, the Weird Al spin to their songs. And it's, it's usually a badge of honor for people because they know that they've had a hit if it, it is something that, that Al wants to parody. But uh, there have been some instances where it hasn't always been completely appreciated. Well, the, the, the famous one is Prince. Uh, Al wanted to do uh, a parody of a Prince song back in the 80s, and, and uh, Prince was pretty adamant uh, you know, about, about uh, you know, the, the deal is when, when Al does a parody, he has to, 
Well, I don't know if I don't know if he absolutely has to, but it's smart. It's it's financially wise in terms of the negotiation for the uh, the the money split to make sure that the original writer, and again, the writer is not always the artist. Uh, in Prince's cases, he's you know the artist and the writer, and I'm sure holds the publishing on that stuff. So you absolutely need to get him in on it. You need to get the writers of the songs in on it to say you know is I, I want to do this and and we'll do let's say a 50 50 split or whatever it is and if they say yes and you know 99 percent of them have uh you're good you know and and uh that usually translates to a video as well although not always and there's uh in eminem's case he granted uh, permission for the song but not for he didn't give sync rights so that you could put the song to a visual to a video whether or not it was a parody of his lose yourself video. That didn't matter. He just, he did not want that song associated with a video by another artist. So we put out an album and that was on the uh, poodle hat album in 2003. And, uh, uh, the album was a top 10 album, I believe. And, uh, had, uh, I think a top 10 album was it. And, uh, no, was it, was it poodle hat? You know what? I'm, uh, my yeah. mind is going. It was so many years ago. Whatever the album was, it went out without a, a lead video, and it did just fine. The album did fine, and and uh, you know, the 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 term at the time was you know video schmidio. You know who needs a video? Well, it certainly helps. It, you know, it certainly would have helped the album even more, but didn't hurt it. It was a top ten album, whatever whatever the case. Right. And uh, so that was one case where an artist sort of went met out halfway. But yeah, Prince was uh, notorious for turning him down. Um, Paul McCartney turned Al down for a song called "Chicken Pot Pie," a parody of "Live and Let Die." <laughs> and there was an entire uh, we, we had an entire song. I have a tape of us rehearsing the entire song, and uh, in hopes of getting permission to go ahead and record it. And uh, at the last minute, Paul came through. He said, "Well, you know, I'm a vegan, and and that's really you know, his chicken is in the title. I don't I don't know. Eh, maybe not." Uh, who else? Someone else didn't. Uh, oh yes, Michael Jackson finally turned Al down. You know, first we got Eat It, uh, which which Michael loved. I'm told. Uh, then 1988, Fat for uh, Michael Jackson's Bad, which again I'm told uh, he loved, and he lent Al his set that that was built a, a recreated subway set at the uh, Culver Studios or the Sony Studios in Culver City, and it was a whole set built to resemble a sub- subway, and he had shot something. There was. I think it was affectionately known as Baby Bad. It was it was the bad video, but with kids. So they duplicated the set, and before it got turned torn down, uh, you know, he he let Al go in there and record the fat video. So which was very very cool of him to do that. In 1992, uh, Michael turned down Al for uh, the song Black or White, and Al wanted to do Snack All Night, and uh, a song about food. Why why not, right? And in a way, you know, because Michael said, well, Black and White's a very personal song, you know, about race relations and this stuff. And, you know, I, you know enough with the parodies already. So Al was, was uh, supposedly left without a lead single for that album, except then he got the idea to do Smells Like Nirvana, which arguably w- would have been a much bigger hit. Well, it was a much bigger hit than I can imagine Snack, or no- Snack All Night having been. Uh, so that was a really, that was a good stroke of luck with Michael that third try and uh with the fact that kurt said yes you know and and i think kurt was a little bit of a fan and and famously said you know the you know we you know you've made it you know we knew we had made it when uh, weird al decided to do our song (laughs) you know again because once once you have a song that's popular enough that's mainstream enough you know or you're a group that's mainstream enough and and you know al chooses to parody you that's a pretty big choice you know you have to be pretty far up there to get al to jump on you Oh. And so Kurt, Kurt was absolutely right. What about the Coolio story? Coolio, now, uh, I was actually, I was, we were in the studio, and, and I was sitting there, and one of the guys from the label came in and told Al, he said, uh, he said, we got permission to go ahead with uh, Amish Paradise. And so we went ahead and put that together. And I'm, I'm not sure exactly what happened. Uh, apparently someone from Coolio's label said something to someone else at our label and, and made it seem like it was okay and all this stuff, but Coolio apparently didn't really give permission. And there was a famous uh, a little press conference he did. I don't know if it was after the Grammys or one of the awards show and one of those after show things where they record 
you know, they, they do sort of a press conference and somebody in the audience said, you know, what do you think about Weird Al's Amish Paradise? And, uh, cool, I've got a recording of his whole speech. And Coolio said, oh, I, I ain't with that. I, he didn't get my permission and all this other stuff. And now I don't think Coolio had actually heard the song. I think Coolio thought he was making fun of him, that mm-hmm. Al was making fun of Coolio, uh, which is not the case at all. Uh, you know, Al doesn't make fun of other artists or songs unless it's uh, Billy Ray Cyrus and Achy Breaky Heart, you know, Achy Breaky Song. That one, yeah, but not Amish Paradise, not Coolio. Anyway, they kissed and made up many years later. I'm sure Coolio made more than a few dollars on that album. It did very, very well. <laughs> it did. In fact, I think it's I think it may be a double platinum album. And it and it's it's certainly another one of those tracks that you know broke a whole new audience. Uh, now, you know, Al's moving in, and not that he was shying away from it before, but, you know, moving into the world of hip hop parodies. I mean, that was, he, again, always staying current with the times, uh, the band always learning to play what the biggest hits are. It's, it's probably one of the few bands that's been able to adapt to all the different styles of music that have happened over the past 40 years. Well, we've had to, that's Al's agenda and, and we can either do that or be replaced. I guess. And I didn't want to get replaced. You know, when we were recording in the, in the mid eighties and we were doing the, uh, I think it was specifically, uh, the Devo song, uh, the, the Devo song, uh, dare to be stupid rather. Uh, I went out and bought a drum machine. You know, I was not going to have some keyboard player program parts. You know, I'm the drummer. So I went and got a drum machine you know, that was the beginning of my, uh, exploration into uh, sounds and programming and, and uh, eventually sound design. You know, where I began to create sounds and not rely, rely on what was in the machine because that's what producers were doing. They were going way outside of the box, literally outside of the box, and uh, making up sounds, you know, making up drum sounds and, and effects. And, you know, not just for drums. I mean, keyboard sounds and, and just sounds that weren't anything, just new sounds. And they were just inventing stuff. And we were always a few steps behind them, you know, trying to, to catch up. So I, I got on that right away. And... Uh, and, and it has, again, it's, it's been a learning experience. It's been very cool and has opened up my eyes to a lot of things. You know, had I not done that, had I not been Al's drummer, it's very unlikely I would have gotten into machines and programming and all the rest of the stuff. It's very unlikely that I would have uh, been on the road or been in videos or, or been able to make a full-time living playing drums. I mean, how, did, how was it that you came to the drums uh, in the first place? My brother originally played drums, and there's a story behind that story behind the man behind the drums. Uh, uh, we lived in Chicago. My father was in advertising, and he did uh, some kind of a, a thing with uh, the one of the big drum companies there, Ludwig. He did some kind of an advertising campaign, and rather than pay my dad, uh, they gave him a snare drum outfit, a, a drum, a stand, sticks, brushes, a bag for the drum, a book, a record, a practice pad, you know, basically set up, you know, kind of a little student kit. And uh, my brother started to learn to play drums. So my father bought uh, the rest of a drum set that matched that kit. And, uh, so my brother was taking drum lessons and, and, uh, we moved to Phoenix in 1960 and he continued with the drums. Uh, I actually started taking accordion lessons of all things. Uh, well, he gave up the drums and, uh, switched to guitar and I gave up the accordion and switched to drums. We basically moved him across the hall to my bedroom and, and, uh, maybe August or September of 1965, I started taking drum lessons and that's the beginning of, uh, of my you know, my love for drums. Now, of course the Beatles were popular. So I was had Beatle albums and was listening to stuff on the radio. Uh, my parents had, uh, Gene Krupa records. They had Latin orchestra records. They had, uh, Alan Sherman records. So I had a little bit of taste of, uh, comedy and parody, you know, even at that age, you know, before I knew that it would serve me well later on, but that's how I began playing. I inherited my brother's drums and, uh, moved from the accordion to the drums and, uh, I never looked back. See, and that's that's what I've always loved about the the music that you guys create is there's a level of sophistication to it that is a throwback to some of those uh, you know the novelty acts of the of the fifties and the sixties where or, and even going all the way back to Spike Jones where there was you you had to get it I mean it wasn't just something that was very base there had to be you know you had to be savvy enough to understand what was being done if you look at YouTube now there's tons of you know, parody songs being put out there and, and, and TikTok is full of them too and all of that. But people just don't have that same level of sophistication that's been brought to, you know, the previous generation of, of novelty and parody songs. Well, true. You know, I wonder if a lot of the parodies that are online would exist the way they do, you know, or if as many would exist if you didn't have Weird Al 
out there. I mean, there's really been nobody else in the last 40 years on, on a national, on an international level doing what he's done and, and, uh, you know, bringing that to the mainstream, you know, and that's thanks to MTV. Uh, that's thanks to, uh, well, that's thanks to having uh, records on, on on a major label or two. Uh, you know, it's thanks to going out and doing live shows. You know, a lot of the people that have their, and there's some very clever stuff on YouTube and TikTok and stuff, but they're not going out, they're not putting out, uh, you know, 12 of those at a time. You know, they're not uh, performing those live in front of people. You know, it's not the same thing. You know, those are a lot, it's a whole series of little one-shot kind of things. And again, a, a, many of them are very, very clever. Uh, a lot of political stuff, of course, especially right now, and and uh, that's not that's not. I, I think that comes from having Al as as uh, to to look up to, you know, as an inspiration. Really, you know, it would be out there a little bit, but really, before Al, it had been a while before there'd been anybody really kind of doing parodies. You know, Alan Sherman, Smothers Brothers, uh, Tom Lehrer, kind of Spike Jones, of course, but. You know, really in the in the seventies, I, I I think there was a gap there, and when Al came in, he filled in that void and has held on to it, you know, very tightly for well, I've been with him for forty years now. And if, and if you look at not only that, but just the impact that he's had on on comedy too, overall, I mean, there's been so many people that have gotten into uh, you know perform you know, comedy performing because of the videos or because of UHF, which is you know one of the most significant culturally significant films ever made, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I, well, thank you. It, it really it really has kind of set the tone for the and and set the sense of humor for an entire generation and and even beyond that generation. Well, hopefully, uh, you know, I, I hope we, uh, well, we will, we're going to hang on to it longer. Uh, you know what, as, as, as long as the fans come out and see us, uh, we'll keep doing this. Well, we're going to be taking a break in a few moments. And when we do, we're going to bring on the other guys from the band as well. And we're going to continue talking about Weird Al's career and about their careers, about how they have uh, been able to adapt with the times and play all of this music. And we'll also find out, you know, what, what's it like being able to go out and perform in front of these crowds and, and to have, you know, these beloved songs and to see crowds standing out there that, and it, it's a joke. It's a running, you know, not a joke, but it's like, it's kind of like the running, you know, catch thing, catchphrase that people say, but it's everybody from toddlers to grandparents out there in the crowd. I've been to weird Al shows and it's everybody across the board. That that's got to make you feel better than anything. No, it's very cool. Our, our audience is a very wide demographic. I mean, there, there's literally six-year-olds, there's 60-year-olds. There's a bunch of 60-year-olds on stage. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's a very wide demo. And back in the original days, we played mostly to like kind of a high school college crowd. In fact, we were playing in, in bars, uh, in clubs and bars. So you had to pretty much be in school, or we played the schools in some cases, the colleges. And that was our crowd. It was mostly male. It was kind of the Three Stooges, Monty Python sort of a thing, you know, where it's like there, there weren't too many females in the audience. And that's, that's evened out. It's very 50-50 now and a very wide age range. And, again, that's partly because we've hung on to a lot of our fans from the 80s. And we also appeal to a lot of, you know, their kids and grandkids. And, and uh, you know, there's, there's little kids and there's a bunch of old ladies and men in the audience. And it's very cool. All right, well, we are going to take a break. When we come back on the other side, the rest of the band will join us. Stephen J., Jim Kimo West, Ruben Valtiero. We will have the entire group of them all together for the remainder of the show to talk about all things uh, music, all things weird. And I, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. If anybody has any questions that they would like to submit, you can do so by emailing me, Tim at midnight.fm. You can post them in the Midnight Society Facebook group. You can talk about it on Twitter with the hashtag Midnight FM. And if you are a member of Midnight FM, then you can jump into the uh, Discord server. If you're a member at the right levels, you can jump in there and uh, drop in your questions as well. And later on, maybe even we can throw the phone lines open, although that might get confusing uh, with, uh, with all of those phone numbers, uh, with all the uh, folks on and taking phone calls. But, you know, we, we can give it a try. Stay tuned. We'll be talking more about the world of weird in just a few moments here on Midnight FM. Stay tuned. Midnight Society will return in a moment.
You're listening to Midnight Society with Tim Weisberg on Midnight FM. And welcome back into Midnight Society here on Midnight FM. I am geeking out tonight because tonight we have four of the best musicians in the world, four of my favorite musicians to listen to my entire life, not to make them feel old, but we have uh, joining us tonight. Already you've been hearing from John Bermuda Schwartz, the longtime drummer for Weird Al Yankovic, and now we're going to bring in the rest of the guys from the band, and I'll introduce them all one by one. We'll make sure that we have them all on the line because... You know, the limits of our technical system, I had to add them during the break and they couldn't hear me. So, you know, it's we're going to roll the dice and see if they're here. We'll see what happens. But uh, Stephen J is an American bassist who is best known. Sorry, you're having for, trouble. Your oh, message has been sent. I, I don't know who that message was for. Uh, we'll have to <laughs> we'll have to see who I didn't get on the line. Uh, let's see. I see that I have uh, Ruben. I see that I have. I'm here. Uh, okay. What? Who's who's with us? We have Ruben. Uh, Ruben. There's nobody here named Ruben. Okay, but we have Ruben. Yes. Then you've got Steve. Okay. And we got Steve. So we're missing Jim. We need chemo. So uh, I'll see if I'll see if Michelle can get him to dial in while we're no, talking. I've got I've got all his parts sampled. I can play him. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need a guitarist. He just gets in the way. Well, I mean, uh, you know, the, there's. There's probably something to be said for, you know, these days, uh, everybody kind of can be sampled and everybody can kind of be produced electronically, but it's different when you can get all, all the guys in the band. Uh, and I'm so sampled right now, Oh, this is, this is just the recording. This is a recording. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll work with that as best we can. Uh, so let me introduce each of you. I mentioned Steve. So Steve, you're here with us. Yep. All right. And, uh, and we have Ruben with us as well. Uh, let me give you a quick bio on him. Much. I'm I'm actually in the middle of my radio broadcast, my Ruben Radio, Radio Ruben, and I'm taking a break to say hello to all of you guys. Oh, you're you're that's right. You're live on the air every night that's now, right? right? That's right. I'm live on the air with tons of women hanging on upon every word, and they're saying, "Why are you leaving us?" And I'm saying, "Well, because I want to hang out with Tim Weisberg, and and I want to jam with him in the flute." I was, I was going to say, everybody thinks I'm the flute player. I feel, oh, you're not? I'm, I'm not. I, I feel so much pressure now to, to learn how to play the flute. Listen, Ruben, I don't want to take your job, but, I mean, I can play 96 tiers on the keyboard. Uh, you got my job. <laughs> what job? My career is over. Now I just need to write some parody lyrics for it. It's my all- career is over. First of all, though, I would like to say hello to Steven, and I would like to say hello to Bermuda. Hey, Hello. You know, hey, hey, Steve. Hey, you guys a ton, and then I will be hey, quiet. Uh, well, I, I want to say, well, I mean, well, I know you said you were on the air, Ruben. How, how long can you stay with us? No, I'm here for, I was, uh, I put it, I told him I'd be back in an hour. Okay. Is that cool? Yeah, absolutely. We appreciate any time that, that you guys can give us. And, and I think we've got, you know, a lot of uh, stuff to cover, but I really want to invite all the fans out there that do have any questions to just send them on in. Tim at midnight.fm. You can post them in the Midnight Society Facebook group. Uh, that's easy to find. It's a public group. And uh, you can put them on Twitter, hashtag Midnight FM, and I'll try to work them all in as much as we can. But uh, the first question that I have, and, and we'll just kind of throw it open to, to whoever wants to answer it, but... Are you guys, have you been staying busy, it sounds like it, uh, with all the things that have been going on in the world the past, you know, 10 months? You guys first. Go ahead, Steve. Yep, I've been staying busy. And I, do you, I, I believe, did I see that you have a new album coming out? Yeah, yeah, I'm working on songs all the time. Plan on releasing it next year sometime. And what, you know, what, what kind of music do you play when, when you're playing on your own? Well, it's a kind of experiments in funk, I guess you could call it. And it, it, it seems like, you know, it, it probably being experimental allows you to explore a different creativity. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely wide open. And, uh, do you find too that, uh, you know, with, with everything that's been 
shut down and, and having to stay home and all that, has that kind of helped foster some of the creativity? Yes, it definitely has. I have a nice studio, and so it's a perfect place to be holed up in during this time, and uh, I'm making the most of it. And also um, a lot of uh, remote sessions, too, that are, that are fun to do at this time. Yeah, I've noticed a lot of those happening. Uh, these, you know, everybody kind of connecting over Zoom or what have you and, and performing songs together. That can't be as easy as they're making it look. There's got to be a lot of edits that have been going on in some of those performances. Yeah, well, I guess the technology is, is evolving pretty quickly. Um, things are just getting better and better as far as the difficulties that that format presents. Uh, and and I know uh, Ruben, you've been doing things with Facebook, right? I'm, uh, I've been I've been broadcasting at least two hours a night every night for the past uh, nine months on Facebook. I took a break for a couple of couple of weeks, and I'm basically playing two uh, pre-recorded tracks, or else like Band in the Box, I Real Pro, and covering everything from Coltrane to Chikoria to Herbie Hancock, channel, channeling uh, my boy Tyner doing a lot of Latin stuff, doing a lot of salsa, doing a lot of Latin jazz. I have people from all over the world tuning in every night. Um, there's a lot of people out there that are, that are, they really need to connect with people because they're, they're kind of, they're holed up, they're isolated, and they're lonely, and they're sad, and they're depressed. And they tell me that, you know, these two hours every day, really, really, really meet their day. And they, they, they thank me for profusely, and I feel honored and humbled that they keep coming back and listening. And then I'm also doing things like I'm teasing them and abusing them, and they just keep coming back for more. So it's yeah. a lot of fun. That's uh, that's when you know that they miss going out to, uh, you know, the 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 Dick Doherty's last resort. It's like you know, I miss, I, I miss the the regular bars that I'd go to. I miss the regular restaurants when they start to get into like month eight or nine. That's when like I miss those restaurants where they insult us when we go there. Let's get some of that. Now, I have one, I have a, co- a couple of questions for you though. Sure. Um, are we talking UFOs? If you would like, so I heard from my producer Michelle. That you, you're not only an Art Bell fan, but that you've had some experiences. Oh, well, I've had experiences, but I'll leave the band out of this. Um, I am the guy. You want to I want to ask you a question. What do you think of Phil Schneider? Uh, remind Who is Phil Schneider? Remind me of him. Schneider was the guy at Dual Sea Mountain when they were doing the firefight with, the, uh, with all the aliens on the, uh, you know, the basically the laboratories that they have deep inside the mountain. You don't, you don't know this? Uh, th- th- yeah. The, the ones that were inside the mountain, right? Yeah. You know, with the seven, with the seven levels with, uh, and the, with the, the reptilians in the chamber of horrors and everything. I was wondering what you thought of that. And do you think Stephen Greer is actually an alien himself? Have you looked at him closely? Listen, uh, you're not the first person to bring that up, Ruben. I- I've heard that Thank from other much. people too. I'll be here all night. Uh, you know, and, and, and that's that's the, the new thing that's been coming around is, uh, you know, somebody actually mentioned on the, the AM station that I work on uh, during the day, somebody brought up David Icke and just casually mentioned, well, you know, David Icke's actually a reptilian anyway that's just putting out disinformation. And I said, this is where we're at in the world now that the, you know, the late night paranormal talk radio stuff is now working its way into the political talk. So... It's a strange place that we you live know, in now. It, it was fun to listen to Art Bell back in the day when we were coming home from gigs, you know, because you, you could always count that he was going to be there at 2 o'clock in the morning. And he kept you up, you know. Um, but then uh, George Norrie took over, and it seems like uh, it seems like he'll have any, just anybody on the show that says, oh, I saw something funny, or, you know, my Uncle Harry had two hip bones or something. He's like, oh, really, really? And so I kind of let it go after a while. Anyway, enough of uh, enough of aliens. Well, we never get enough of those here. So, Talk to you guys. but I mean, that's that's what is is got to be great about the camaraderie that you all have is that you know being together for so long, it seems like you could probably tell each other anything. Uh, mostly telling each other off. <laughs> we are we are a uh, we're a family. Uh, it's a very tight knit group. It's a very wonderful dysfunctional family. Dysfunctional, yes. But but still a family. So I do I do have a few questions that have been coming in. Let me throw those out before uh, before we have to let Ruben go. But what this question comes from Derek. He wants to know if you've had the opportunity 
to play, you know, or hang out with Barnes and Barnes? We, uh, that's for those guys. Well, I, I, because I spent some time, you know, on, on the Dr. Demento show, you know, answering phones and stuff like that early on, uh, Barnes and Barnes would be there. What's interesting is I went to school with both of them before really? they were Barnes and Barnes, uh, with Bill, uh, Bill Moomy and I went to the same schools and, uh, uh, Robert Hamer as well. I didn't know them at the time, but, uh, we, we found out later we did actually as a band, uh, back up Barnes and Barnes for Dr. Demento's 20th anniversary live show. Where we met? Where, where, and that was Ruben's first gig that we met on, that we played uh, together. He was in sort of this so 13 or 15 piece orchestra. Uh, uh, Steve J was the, uh, the, uh, I guess, a band leader, the musical director for the night, you know, conducted. He was plugged into the, to the booth and they would say, okay, you know, and out, you know, and do all, get all the cues and stuff like that. And Ruben was on piano. Anyway, we backed up Barnes and Barnes doing a song called, uh, touch myself. Well, really? <laughs> not, not the divinals, but, uh, uh, you know, this other thing that they had, not a parody of that though. But, but, and that's the only time actually we've really, uh, sort of interacted live with them, but certainly we've, we've run into them and they used to hang out, uh, on the Dr. Demento show all the time. I feel like I have to explain some of the, the weirdness to the normal folks that are listening, but Barnes and Barnes had a, had a hit song called fish heads that a lot of people will, you know, they'll, they'll know it if they, if they don't know that they know it. Uh, but as, 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 uh, as John mentioned, Bill Moomy was part of that group. And, and that's the same Billy Moomy that was on lost in space and on the twilight zone. And, uh, and, and really, you know, has been a musician for a long, long time. And, and they became producers and they produced a Crispin Glover album, uh, you know, you want to talk about staying in the world of weird. I mean, it's, it, it seems like everybody that plays this music and, and, and that has a love for this type of music, there's a kinship among you all. A, a little bit. It's sort of hard. You know, I mean, there's, it's hard to avoid everyone. You know, you we're, we're all not quite in a bubble, but we're sort of, you know, we're sort of in the same place and that's all really thanks to Dr. Demento. I mean, he's sort of got everyone together. I mean, he's the reason I met Al and, and, uh, you know, he's the reason that anybody cares about Al really, you know, had Al tried to go out on his own with parodies as an accordion player, if he wasn't already well known and, and hadn't sort of broke out, you know, to, to morning drive time radio with bus that year, it, it would have been a much tougher climb, you know, and, and perhaps not, not had anywhere near the staying power, even if he had got out a video or two or an album or two, uh, you know, it may have run its course early on. Um, you know, the, the fact that, that he was well liked and, and all that, you know, certainly has a lot to do with it. But I mean, Dr. Demento really has, has brought a lot of people in, in front of each other. And, and, you know, he's there, that's a family too. You know, that's, that's pretty cool. I'm still in touch. I'm, I'm in touch with a lot of the people from, uh, from that group. Well, I'll, I'll, I usually don't let the cat out of the bag uh, when we're talking about guests, but I did task producer Michelle with getting Dr. Demento on the show. I was supposed to have him on my spooky South coast show when he was promoting the punk album and, uh, and we weren't able to work things out time wise. So I'm hoping now with the new release that he has coming out in November, which just sounds incredible. Uh, you know, some of the, the earliest novelty hits of all time. I'm hoping that we can get him on to, uh, to, to come on and promote that even for a little while, because, uh, you know, he is not only a legend, but as you're saying, you know, he's kind of the godfather of all of this. And, and that's what we, you know, we needed somebody to kind of continue on with that type of music, even as, uh, I think radio was changing. And even in the, the late seventies, early eighties, it was starting to become more commercialized and it was less about the DJs coming in and playing whatever it was that they wanted. So it was good to have somebody like that, that would play things that were, intentionally subversive and intentionally, you know, rocking that system. So we'll, we'll be glad to certainly help promote that album uh, as best we can if the good doctor will join us. So hopefully that'll happen, but you know, we'll see. Uh, well, he's, he's a, he's a very good interview and, and you know, the musicologist in him is, is just fascinating. And that's what a lot of those old songs on that, on that CD that's coming out are. I mean, those are the kind of things he played before people started making music that catered to his show uh, that's the kind of stuff he played all the time. He played a lot of jazz, you know, a lot of very obscure kind of things. And, and the wackiest he got really was Spike Jones and Tom Lehrer and Stan Freeberg. And, uh, you know, until a lot of the listeners like Al started sending in their own wacky stuff. And then the show really began to cater to that. 
And uh, thankfully it did. I mean, that's the, a lot to do with Al's success and, and our success. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you just look at some of the artists that had those those songs uh, that would have been forgotten and lost to history if it wasn't for Dr. Demento bringing them back to the forefront. I mean, look, A Shaving Cream, one of the, you know, the greatest novelty songs of all time might never have been remembered at all if it wasn't for Dr. Demento bringing it back. Well, true. Uh, he, we, we owe him a lot. And, and of course, uh, later he sang it himself, too. So that was yes. a pretty good one. Uh, re- really quickly here, and then uh, I want to ask uh, Ruben and Steve about joining the band. Uh, this question comes in from Matt in New Jersey. He wants to know if there are any sheet music books for the albums that you guys have put out, and if not, are there any plans to release them? <clears throat> John would know about that. There, yeah, there is. There's the Weird Al anthology, and that's got 12 or 15 uh songs in it and i think it's for piano guitar vocal and and that's the sheet music uh for those songs so uh, yes or in the case of the parodies if you can find sheet music for the original song you right. can find al's lyrics and you can just sing it over that yeah you know, that's... Then, then you have your own version of that song but uh, yeah al did put out uh, the weird al anthology uh that was a, a sheet music book so let, let's get into the, kind of the backstory of, of each of the other guys joining the band. Uh, Steve, I know that you came in very early on. Uh, kind of explain to us how you met Al and, and the rest of the guys in the band and how, how you came to be part of this crazy ride. Well, I saw an ad in a magazine called The Music Connection in L.A. that I was uh, looking to form a band, so I went to an audition, and uh, and that was it. So then what were you thinking when you arrived and realized that this is what the gig was all about? Well, I had heard, uh, Al, another one rides the bus, you know? And so I knew what he was all about before I got there. And it, it was just, uh, very inviting, you know, sounded like it was going to be a lot of fun. And, and we talked a bit with John, uh, about, you know, the, the, the difficult level, the difficulty level of having to learn to play, uh, some of these songs and getting to the point where, you sound exactly like the original artists. Was that something that was, uh, you know, a process for you or was it something that came easy kind of being able to mimic some of these, these big hits of the time? Well, it's, uh, um, well, I don't think, uh, it's possible for me to think of it as hard work because every shred of it was just so enjoyable. Mm-hmm. And I just love getting into music and studying parts and learning them and playing them. So uh, it was an absolute labor of love all the way. Uh, when, when did you first pick up the bass? I guess I was 13. It was uh, right after Louie Louie came out and just before the Beatles broke, a couple of months before that. And and what do you know what it was that drew you to that instrument? Was it just, you know, seeing it for the first time? You're like, that's the one for me? Uh, well, yes, yeah, there was a couple of factors. For one thing, in listening to music, for some reason, I always picked out the bass parts and focused on them and, and really enjoyed listening to bass parts. But I had been playing piano since I was very little and, and some classical guitar, too. And one day uh, when I was in junior high school, a friend of mine said, that they're uh, looking to form a band, and uh, they didn't have didn't have a bass player, so I became the bass player. And and it's it it seems like it. yeah it seems like you know the 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 bass for me I mean I tried to play guitar for a couple of years I I just couldn't connect with it I picked up the bass and I'm not good at that either and I really can't play it very well but at least when I when I when I put it in my hands and I started playing the music, it started, everything started to make more sense to me, you know, just being able to, to carry the rhythm of the song like that. Yeah. yeah and a single note can go a long ways on the bass. And you really yeah, have when to, when I first started playing, oh, sorry. Oh, no, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, when I first started playing, I joined this band and I didn't have a bass. All I had was my classical guitar. So they were doing gigs at youth centers. So I would go to the gigs and, and uh, sit on a stool and hold my ear up against the body of the guitar so I could hear my bass parts. You know? And it was really fun. You know, it was, uh, I did that for maybe a month or two of gigs. And then my dad 
took me to Sears and bought me a silver tone bass and I had my first real bass. And, but I started off just sort of in my own little world on stage where nobody could hear me, but me just practicing and learning how to fit in with the band. And, and we know that in a band, you know, the, the bass player and the drummer, they have to really connect and have a chemistry. John, what was it like when, when you first got to play with Steve, did you feel that there was, that there was a chemistry there between you? Oh, very much. Steve is, is very meticulous and very precise and, uh, uh, very easy to work with. Uh, you know, there's, you know, you go into the studio and there's a lot of, you know, you have to do extra takes or you have to punch stuff in. And Steve is the one guy that can pretty much run down his part and, and it's done, you know, the very, very few fixes with him. He's the one guy in the band that, that has the least amount of extra work to do. And, uh, he's just, he's one of the most dedicated people to his instrument that I know. So it's, it was, uh, it's, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to work with all these guys, really. I mean, Al was very, it, it was kismet or, or whatever you want to call it, that this group sort of fell together, came together the way it did. Um, you know, just, it's just, it's, it's one of those things. And there's a few groups that are like that in history. Uh, you know, the Beatles, obviously, yeah, they had, you know, the beat best and all that stuff. But I mean, once they were the Beatles, you know, that was them. You know, it's a few groups like that that stay that way the whole time, and there's a reason for that. You know, there's there's a a, a camaraderie, of course, but there's the ability to work with each other and, and make good music. You know, and in our case, we work with each other very well, and we also adapt to Al's agenda, which is always he's always throwing stuff at us that's new and different, and uh, and and stretches us a lot. You know, he really he pushed my limits a lot in terms of you know, programming and, and sequencing and sound design and stuff like that. I mean, there's, you know, d drum parts or things that pass for drum parts and drum sounds are very subjective. You know, there's not just a way to hear something and say, oh, you know, that's that's a sample that's uh, on this machine or that's on this keyboard. There's things that are just made up. So he's really pushed us all, and, and we've all risen to the occasion. I don't think anybody ever had to get thrown out and Al brought in someone else because we couldn't meet his agenda because we couldn't do the song. We've always done whatever he's wanted us to do. And, and I, I know we're all better musicians for it. And I do want to get into a little bit later on the process of that, how it all comes together when the idea is sparked and getting it from, from there, from the idea to the final version that we hear uh, either on the album or now just being released as a, as a song. But uh, Ruben, you, you came into this band later on that was already uh, a pretty tight knit operation. What was that like for you to, to, to come into the weird Al band? I'm going to surprise the band members by being as humble as I can. What? <laughs> I told you. No, you don't want to hear that? Okay, I've got the toughest part in the band. How's that? Shall I go there? No, I won't. Um, what was the question? <laughs> I, really, what was the question? Well, I was I was asking about what it was like to come into this uh, this this unit that was well, already the is, together. The thing is, is that I had I had arrived in L, in LA about a year before, and I came in I came to LA basically as a hot shot jazz fusion keyboardist, and you know very showy and, and doing very challenging stuff, and really into uh, really into groove or trying to be and just just really just challenging stuff and um i and so i was new in town and then there was a message on the machine saying uh, uh, there's this gig i was trying to meet as many people as possible i was going into salsa the salsa circles jazz circles fusion circles rock circles everything uh i would have never thought that i my main gig would be in the comedy circle um, and so there was this call, there was this message on the phone and said, uh, Weird Al wants you to, uh, play, you know, wants you to back him up. I'm like, oh, okay. And it turned out to be the, uh, Dr. Demento 20th anniversary where I basically went up and, uh, I played all the, uh, simple, simple parts, uh, for, for all the, the rest of the people. Um, and then I did the Al stuff, and Al was obviously the big, 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 big star, and I really wanted to impress him. And basically, I went and I showboated and made a spectacle out of myself. And he and he remembered me and asked me to come out on tour. And the rest is history. And I'm surrounded by 
the most professional guys in the business. It is it is totally pro. These guys are the best. Um, my parts are my parts can be very challenging because sometimes it's very hard to have to recreate uh, certain keyboard parts or synth parts that were done with machines that were uh, you know that were around maybe forty years ago and haven't been seen since. And then where I would actually call the person who played that part and say, what was that program? How did you do that program? They basically go, I don't know. I forget. I go, what'd you use? I don't know. I forget. And I have to make up the sounds on my own that, that are unique to the, to the keyboard. I have to figure out what the keyboard is. And usually these keyboards, they'll, they'll have a unique sound. That's what they're known for. And that's it. You know, and I would have to try to find these keyboards or something that sounded like it. And I would audit and, you know, I'd spend hours and hours and hours. And then I would, uh, you know, show it to Al and he'd go, nope, that ain't it. <laughs> and I'd have to start all over again. It was very, very trying. It was very challenging. And it got my, my programming skills up a lot. You know, the hardest part about uh, touring for me or doing anything with Al for me is basically the pre-production. The playing, the playing is fun, but it's the pre-production that takes all the time. I'm talking sometimes months to get ready for a tour, to get it sounding just right, because if it doesn't sound just right, then it's not Al. Al doesn't, Al won't, uh, you know, settle for anything that doesn't sound perfectly right. He made me leave the, uh, he made me leave the, the saga begin sessions about I think at least twice because I didn't you know the American Pie the Don McLean mm -hmm. uh, sound alike because it didn't sound exactly exactly right and we weren't playing to a click he wanted it so perfect that it that if you a B'd the tracks it would sound like my piano was actually phasing with the other piano they were so close and wow. so that was like one of the toughest sessions I ever had. This is uh, this experience was very, very, very good for me, and I, I'm proud to be part of it. And I'm, I consider myself honored. Well, we're, we're that's gonna, my story. Well, well, we'll get more of your story when we come back. We're going to take a break, and during the break, I'll see if I can't connect with Jim. I don't know uh, what's going on there, but we'll try and and connect that call. He's as white. Well. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's in Hawaii. Right. I mean, who, who, who's going to be in Hawaii and want to answer a phone call and talk to us, right? He's in the volcano. <laughs> so we will take a break. Uh, when we come back on the other side, we can also take more of your questions. If you want to submit them, Tim at midnight.fm, or you can put them in the Midnight Society Facebook group. You can put them on Twitter, hashtag midnight FM. You can put them in Discord. And I want to say hi to everybody that's tuned in tonight from the We're All Yankovic's Facebook group. I want to thank everybody from the Dr. Demento Facebook groups that are tuned in tonight. I want to thank everybody, uh, all my friends over in the Gilbert Godfrey's amazing colossal listener society thank you all for coming and joining us i had to share this show in that group with you i don't like to do shameless self-promotion in that group at all but i had to share it with you because i know how much everybody in that group is a fan of these guys and uh, i knew you'd want to hear some of the inside stories of what we're talking about tonight so we will take a break uh, when we come back we will have more as we are talking with the guys behind the weird owl sound the guys who have learned how to play all of those songs so close to the original that you could swear it's the same group, but also who have created some of these amazing, amazing original songs as well. And of course are all excellent musicians with their own careers outside of what goes on with weird Al as well. Stay tuned. We'll take a break. Then more midnight society here on midnight FM.
You're listening to Midnight Society with Tim Weisberg on Midnight FM. And we are back with more Midnight Society here on Midnight FM. Tonight, we are getting weird. We are talking with the band members that uh, play with Weird Al Yankovic. We're talking with John Bermuda Schwartz. We're talking with Stephen Jay. We're talking with Ruben Valtiera. And uh, we're, hopefully, we're going to get Jim Kimo West on. Uh, there seems to be some issues with being able to connect with him. But uh, if you're listening, Jim, uh, Michelle has given you the number, hopefully, so that you can call in. And if the phone rings on the air... You know, if the Skype rings on the air, whatever, it's fine. Uh, We are fine. We are just going to have some fun and roll with it. Uh, And as I mentioned uh, before the break, thank you to everybody out there that's listening for the first time. Hopefully you enjoy the show. Uh, We'll just let you know, though, real quickly what you can expect on the rest of the week here on Midnight Society as we are ramping up to Halloween, uh, which is going to be a a great day of fun here on Midnight FM. Uh, And if you are a fan of comedy, as we're talking about tonight. Maybe you're also a fan of the paranormal. Well, on Saturday nights, we have our Paranormal Comedy Hour. And we have two programs that are guaranteed to make you laugh and also have a paranormal bend to them as well. We have Riffa Normal with Jeff and Gary. And then and that happens at 9 p.m. Eastern. And then at 9.30, we have Strange Cases with Jerry King, the legendary broadcaster who had the TV show Strange Cases that uh, you know Robert Stack ripped off with unsolved mysteries and then we were able to secure jerry's services to come here and turn strange cases into a radio show so you get to hear some of the strangest cases with him that's followed by spooky south coast and we will be live this saturday night for halloween and then after that we have mac maloney's military x files so if you are a comedy fan we've got you covered on saturday nights if you're a paranormal fan we've got you covered pretty much seven days a week you can find out all the information at midnight.fm Uh, The programs are always free when they're live in the archives. You can sign up for starting at just $4.99 a month, which helps us keep this whole crazy network running. But let me tell you what's coming up the rest of the week. Tomorrow night, we'll be talking with Mark Dawidziak. He returns to the program as we're going to be discussing the best in horror entertainment. We're going to be talking about the Twilight Zone. So I'm sure Bill Moomy will come up again tomorrow night. We're going to be talking about Dracula. We're going to be talking about Kolchak the Night Stalker, Dark Shadows, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, Richard Matheson, all All of that stuff is going to come up tomorrow night with Mark Dawidziak. And then on Thursday, we're going to go from the fictional stuff tomorrow night to the real life horror on Thursday night, talking with Deanna Simpson and Joni Mahan about the Hanover haunting. And you are not going to believe this story when you hear it, but it is absolutely true. And then coming up on Friday night, we're going to prepare you for Halloween by talking to somebody who it'll already be Halloween for him when he joins us. We'll be talking with Mark Cowden, Tales from the Haunted Pub. He is actually going to be calling us from a retired haunted pub in Ireland, which now houses a historical society. That building does have paranormal activity, and he's going to be the only person in the building when he is calling in to share with us some of these stories coming up on Friday night. So I think you'll really enjoy that to get you ready for halloween night but we are having so much fun tonight let's get right back into it with john bermuda schwartz Stephen jay and ruben Valtier as we're talking about their careers their lives their work and i had mentioned that we i wanted to talk about the process of of how the the songs come together whether it be a parody song or an original uh john is it that al comes to you guys with the idea and tells you what it is that he needs you to be able to play well, exactly, uh, and and it uh, in the case of the parodies, uh, we know what we need to play. We know what we need to recreate. Now, there may be an edit to the arrangement, or there may be a key change, or there could be a tempo change. But beyond that, we you know we have a roadmap already, which is the original song. Uh, it's rare that he wants to do anything different. If he wants to put in an accordion solo where it didn't belong, that's up to him. But our parts, uh, you know, are are laid out for us in the case of the parodies. And we're pretty much on our own. In fact, we don't demo the parodies at all. And, and we, I, I guess we, if, if it's a parody that's a live band, and it's been a little while since that's happened, but uh, you know, we get together and we'll rehearse it just so we know what we're doing once we're in the studio. But in terms of massaging parts on the parodies, almost not at all. We, we know what we need to do. Now, the original songs, uh, he gives us uh, a little direction or a lot of direction. He'll say, you know, I want this to sound like 
this song from this band, or I want this to have this vibe, but instead of doing this run, do it different and, you know, make sure the, 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 the melody isn't too close, you know, and, and things like that, but he'll have elements, enough of the elements of, of these other groups that he, he wants to style parody and we'll get together. You know, Al will usually do a, his own demo of that just so we know what the song is to begin with. Uh, the band will rehearse and do a demo and then, uh, we will, uh, get together another time and and actually in the studio at that time you know once we got the demo together it's about 98 percent close to what the final song is going to be and we'll get into the studio and, and massage it a little bit more but once we're in the studio it's it's all business all of the working on that stuff and learning parts and making up parts is all done beforehand uh both separately and and as a group in a lot of cases and uh and that's how it all comes together but in terms of of the germ of the idea that's all al and, uh, you know, he may run some, some lines by us, some lyrics or, or a melody or, or some kind of a thing and say, you know, what, what sounds better, this or this, you know, or what do you think we should do here? Or he'll say to Steve or me or Jim or Ruben, you know, you'll, you'll know what to do in this place. Just, you know, you do your thing. Or he may have something specific. But it all does come down to Al. I mean, he's, he's running the whole show. And, uh, you know, and he's very good about conveying what he wants. And sometimes we'll come up with something that he hadn't thought of. And he'll go, yeah, 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 I like that. You know, so that's uh, not me, but Jim and Steve usually will come up with something cool and, and that Al will like. But, uh, you know, 99.9% of it is, is Al. I'm, I'm sorry, Ruben, were you going to say something? Not me. <laughs> oh, is he still there? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know what? Really, though, I, ha I have to give props to Jim West because for the past, for the past uh, I think, 15 years or so, Jim has been really in charge of uh, doing a, a, all the guitar work and, of course, all, all the synth work. So he's the guy that he's the guy that really has made these things sound exactly like, um, um, like like the uh, like the like the tunes. And so what I'll do, or what Al will have me do, is I come in and I basically play the parts in concert, and that's my role. Uh, Jim Jim has uh, Jim has gotten uh, has become a great a great producer when it comes to doing all the uh, doing all the guitar parts of course and all the synth parts because he's got he's got them all in 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 the computer he's 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 a master he's a master of it so it's just it's actually easier to have Jim do the parts and my role is basically to come in and just flesh them out live. But I so mean I have to that's props to Jim. That's that, but that's still a big role to have to be able to because when people come to see you know the live performance, they want to hear it like they've heard it on the album. And and I know with other bands, there's some leeway to be able to say, well, you know, the the live version is definitely different than the than the album version, and and most fans are okay with that. But it's a little bit different when it's a parody song and it's supposed to sound like the original, no matter what. And that's what Al does. I mean, he 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 really wants it to sound just like the record, even in concert, even in concert. Whereas a lot of like live bands would take uh, liberties and you know stretch, throw in a solo here, do a breakdown here, do this or that, you know, and make it really, really just make it a lot more dynamic in in concert. Um, Al actually is insistent that it sounds exactly like the record. Uh, the thing, Steve, for you is, you know, you probably have to, and we mentioned, we talked about this with John a little bit in the first hour, you probably have to somewhat keep up with some of the current music or at least some of the current styles so that you understand what it is that you need to play when he's coming at you with a parody idea. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. And it's no problem. It's fun. So do you, do you keep By an ear way, up? Uh, well, I was just going to say, I don't know if you noticed, but a while back, Jim said that he was here. Jim's on the on the call now. That was I me. Didn't say hi. I was kidding. I was oh, kidding. Ruben was kidding around. That's all right. Oh, okay. we, we have nope. we have Michelle working on it, but somebody brought up the point. One of my listeners brought up the point, sent me a message, and said, "You know, it's Mercury retrograde, which means things don't work." So that could be part of what the problem is. But Michelle is getting the number uh, to Jim to call in. So if the phone rings while we're on the air, whatever, we'll just take it. You know, it's a laid back kind of night. We're not that worried about, you know, a little technical snafu if we can get him on the line. Uh, one, of, one of the other uh, questions that I would have is, has there ever been something that you had attempted 
that, uh, you know, a parody idea that came about, not so much because it wasn't a permission thing, but was there ever a song or a style that you couldn't get to what Al heard in his head and what you wanted to be able to put out for the song? Was there ever anything that you just said, we can't get this one? Genius in France, live. Yeah. Well, no, but in the, in the studio, there's stuff we do in the studio that we, to, to answer your question, I don't think there's, I don't think he's ever been able to stump us. I don't think anything ever had to be abandoned or seriously changed because we couldn't rise to the occasion. We were always right there from. Now, that doesn't mean we can reproduce those songs live, and there's a lot of reasons we can't do that. I mean, one, we're a, basically a four-piece band with Al up front, or if he's wearing his MIDI accordion, you know, we're a five-piece. But there's only so much we can do instrumentally and vocally without a lot of trickery from tracks. We try to not do that too much, unless it's absolutely necessary. We're certainly not the only group to do that. But in the studio, we've been able to do everything he's asked us to do. You know, and more. Uh, I mean, that's that's very impressive. What about though playing polka music? Was that something that was natural for all of you, or is that something that you had to learn when when those songs uh, started to come together? Because those those were always the album highlights for me. I still can't play a polka. <laughs> what about you, Steve? Is polka something that you were familiar with, or did you have to learn? Or I think it's in my genes. So you, you come from a, a family that would listen to polka, and, and that was something that was in your repertoire? I'm, I'm Polish, so yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, born into it. Uh, how about you, John? Was it something that was hard to master? Uh, no, it's just, it's just very fast rock and roll, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, I, I, it was, it's just, you know, that the parts are simple. It's just, it's double time is all. And the way Al does polkas, you know, things will get introduced that aren't really strictly polkas, you know, like little jazzy interludes in the middle, you know, he, he does twist it quite a bit. And also with the polka thing, uh, polka you know, rock songs, for example, uh, there are a lot of changes in rock music that really don't go with old world polka stuff. You know, there's a lot of things that, that, you know, a polka aficionado would listen to. And yeah, it feels like a polka, but the, some of the melodic changes aren't quite you know, they're, they're not authentic, but it's okay. You know, that it's an Al thing, you know, polkifying a, a medley of rock songs or dance songs or whatever it is. Uh, that's what he does. And, and it becomes an Al thing. It becomes an Al polka. So is there ever, uh, you know, you had, you had mentioned that, you know, some of the, some of the tours you've been able to bring back some of the older songs and, and kind of surprise the fans with a little bit when it comes to the polkas, have you ever brought back some of the old classic songs that were worked into those polkas? Or do you always try to keep it with the current stuff? I, I don't think we've ever pulled something out of a polka and played it as a song. And we also, we don't go backwards on the polkas. We do whatever the current polka is. And, uh, and that's it. We just keep moving forward. Uh, because the, the songs that are in the polka are usually of a recent genre or they're recent songs that got polkified. So they're, they have to stay current to go back into a polka we did in 1985, you know, it might be fun for the fans, but there's going to be a ton of people that don't know the songs that are in it. Right. Or they just, or they just think it's an Al song that's fast and has a bunch of random weird lyrics from other groups. You know, they don't understand because they didn't listen to the original songs in the first place. But, That's what makes the polka successful is knowing what the original songs are and why they're funny after they got polkified. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking is that some of those songs, you know, the fans that are that are out there now, they're not going to recognize those original songs that inspired that to begin with. I mean, uh, you know, some of them might be timeless. I'm sure most of the audience would, rec you know, recognize, uh, you know, Rock Me Amadeus, for example. But some of those songs, if you go back and listen to it now, you're like, wait, what was that again? Because they are such glimpses of the time period of when they were put together. Well, true. And unlike the parodies, they didn't necessarily have to be mainstream hits. They could just be something quirky that Al thought sounded funny if it was it was made double time. You know, so, so they, they didn't rely on being... It wasn't held to the same standard that a parody would be. You know, they weren't in full songs. They were just snippets. And uh, he would just throw in all sorts of stuff. I mean, a lot of them were popular songs. And, uh, you know, those, and the polka medley became basically an Al song. It was almost regarded like an Al original. You know, it wasn't really a parody. In fact, it wasn't a parody at all. It was, it was, they were covers. They were just polka covers. Is, is, is it something too that still, I mean, I know that when, when I've seen the band perform, you know, it's always a highlight of the show is to, to hear the polka. And it, it seems like that's always going to be the thing that everybody goes nuts for. 
Yeah. I think he could probably bring back polkas on 45 and, <laughs> and everybody would get it. Right. Those were all classics. Because, I mean, it's got smoke on the water, you know, hey, Jude, LA woman, you know, got a Vita, hey, Joe, you know, Jumpin' Jack Flash, my generation. Those, these are all classic, you know, iconic songs. So that you could bring that one back and everybody would know. And, and I guess you could probably do Hot Rocks Polka too, because, you know, everybody's going to know most of those Timeless Stone songs. Right. And it's not like they've had any hits since we cut that in 1989. So, you know. <laughs> Come on. The so, Voodoo Bound album Mick. was good. That's, Just kidding, Mick. Mick is listening. Oh. Hey, he really, he, I hear he's a fan, you know, nice. so. Hey, who is not a fan of Al? Right. Know, who who really? doesn't love Al? I mean, and, and that's, that's why it, it works so well for, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's something that you can put on, uh, you know, when the, the new album comes out or when the new song comes out these days, whatever it is, you can put it on and everybody in the family is going to stop and listen and check it out because it is something that has appealed to all of these generations, not to make you guys feel old, but as I was saying before, there's very few bands that have been together this long and been able to adapt through all the different styles and, and genres of this. And it shows that, you know, the, not only are you hugely adaptable, but that, you know, Al always has his finger on the pulse of pop culture, even for a guy that's talking about TV shows that aired 40, 50 years ago. <laughs> well, and, and it also speaks to the dedication of all of the members of this band, mm -hmm. to, to all of our loyalty, to Al's loyalty, to the fans' loyalty. There's only, you know, speaking of bands that are, that are still together that have adapted or whether they have or haven't, there's only a couple of bands out there that have, are still together longer than us with their original members and are still touring and making records. I mean, there's a, there's like you two and ZZ top and us. They're touring. And, and that's it. Not this year. They're not, but, uh, uh, you know, until recently we were all touring and making hit records. I mean, you two's last album was a number one album. Our last album was a number one album. ZZ top, had an album anyway they uh i mean every everyone those are, we're the only guys that have been around that long with the same guys you know without member changes you know or who haven't already split up i mean cheap tricks not the same you know led zeppelin split up you know what, what are you going to do right i mean you know we mentioned the stones even the stones aren't the same band that they were when they started out they haven't been the same band since 1970 as far as i'm concerned but uh so you know you mentioned you too hey mick <laughs> You mentioned ZZ Top. I'm noticing that there's something that those bands have in common. They're both in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And I don't know why uh, that you guys are not. Oh, boy. He's considered a comedian. But it's still music. It is, but, you know, it's, it, he's considered a comedian. So, so who do I have to speak to? Is it Jan? Do I have to call Jan Wunner directly and, and talk to him about this? I'll call because there's, there's a, there's a few other bands that I have to talk to him about already. So, uh, I forget who I was talking to recently. We had a guest on the show and I, I railed for a good 10 minutes about, you know, who wasn't in the rock and roll hall of fame, but certainly I think that you know, the, the, you guys certainly should be not only because you have had this long career, look at the amount of records that you have sold. You have sold more records than so many of the bands that are in the rock and roll hall of fame. It's still about the purists. It's the purists. It's their call. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't, we don't agree with them. And the thing is, is that, you know, I, I've seen videos of Al actually going up and, and singing alongside of uh, legendary vocalists. And he kicks them in the butt. He he wiped the floor with these guys. I've seen I've seen them bow to him, fall on their knees and bow to him. He is he's a, he's a force to be reckoned with. But the purists do not. They just no. It's no. You're copying somebody else's song. I don't care how good you play. You're copying somebody else's song. That's just it's it's ridiculous. I mean, nobody has had the longevity and the relevance they, like that. Uh, they don't care about the longevity. The thing is, is that they're saying, no, you didn't write the, you didn't write the, the, the original song wasn't your idea. You know? So, I, so the thing is, you can be a great player, but whatever. I, I bet every band that has been parodied would, would say, yeah. you know, induct them. I think, I think it would be great. But then the question is, who who's going to induct you? It would have to be Dr. Demento, I would think. 
it doesn't really does it really mean anything? So, I mean, it means we get a free trip to Cleveland. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, they do it. They do it in New York and still do, don't they? Oh, do they? Oh, okay. Well, I know the Rock Hall's in Cleveland. I assume they no, don't. Do they charge? There. Don't they charge you like three thousand dollars to sit there? Oh man, what a ripoff! You mean the guys that are being inducted get charged? No, I did. I oh. just wanted <laughs> Steve Miller uh, was really ranting about that that uh, he could, his band couldn't get in. They they they, they wouldn't give him seats, and they were. Char- I think they were even charging Steve Miller. I'm not sure, but he was really ranting about it. It's it's so political. It's ridiculous. Of course, it's it's music, man. It's about what makes you feel. That's what that's that's what should be the the standard for this. Uh, so. In, in looking forward, though, uh, it seems like there's never going to be a time that that you know you guys as musicians are ever going to slow down because in addition to you know the, the the Weird Al projects, you're also always busy on your own. What do each of you do? And I'll, I'll start with you, Steve. What what you know? We know that you have the new album coming out, but what do you do usually in the time that you're not uh, recording and, and performing with Weird Al? Are you, are you playing with other folks? Are you keeping, you know, busy writing other songs? How, how do you keep yourself busy in the downtime? Well, it varies from year to year according to what opportunities there are. Uh, this year there's been, aside from working on my own stuff, um, my son Miles has done a couple of outside projects that I've been able to collaborate with him on and also Ian. And um, Victor Wooten has this music camp that he's had me be a guest performer and speaker at for the past few years. So this year we did it online as a Zoom thing. And that led to some uh, great friendships and collaborations uh, on my new album. And um, that's about it. And, and Ruben, how about yourself? Well, I'm sorry to say, but the thing is, my my take on the whole thing is a lot is 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 darker than most. And the thing is, is that I I basically do not believe that I'm going to really make any sort of money, um, any sort of uh, noticeable income by by trying to produce music and get it out there. Um, if I had been a, a film scorer and pursued that path a long time ago and not been playing live. Um, and just really pursuing that path, maybe, maybe I'd have, you know, because I have friends that are producers that used to play in bands with me and now they went off and they became film, uh, film scorers and that's, and that's how they're making their money. There's, there's still money in that, but just producing albums, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 I just don't think it's not worth it. It's not worth it. I don't, I don't get my money back. I don't. I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard. And the, so the thing is, is what I'm basically concentrating on, is what I feel that I'm best at, which is live performance. And I'm going in and making arrangements uh, in the computer uh, so that it can play along to tracks and that I can entertain uh, people that are online and following me. Um, right now, there's no places to play uh, where I live. I'm, in a, I'm up in, in the wine country in California. And there, there's, there's nothing. There's, 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 there's no places to play even for free, you know. So I'm just spending all my time doing this. Um, you know, I mean, John's, John's got some great side projects on projects. Uh, you've talked about his book, you know, that, that that's a great thing. Yeah. That is for me, the whole thing about playing music I'm so, um, or, or produce, uh, putting out an album. I, I'm sorry to be dark, but I just don't see the money in it anymore. I, I, I think that I think the whole scenario has changed. I think the whole game has completely changed. And so basically what I'm doing is I'm just trying to be, become a better musician and getting stronger every day uh, by practicing, playing, uh, playing online, playing for people. I've, I've, I've got no hopes to make any sort of music uh, by recording. I'm sorry to go there. No, no, it's okay. I mean, truth is what we're after here. Uh, we're going to take a break here. Uh, we'll keep, we're still trying for Jim. I know Michelle said she sent him over the number, so uh, hopefully he can join us, but we will take a break. And when we come back on the other side, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the book. We'll talk more about uh, getting out there and touring. We'll talk about the fans. And if the fans have any questions and would like to call in, you can do so at 508-322-1985, 508 322 1985 
That is the number if you would like to call in with a question. You can also email them, Tim, at midnight.fm if that is easier for you. You can put them in the Midnight Society Facebook group. You can put them on Twitter with the hashtag MidnightFM. And you can also put them in Discord if you're a member at Midnight FM uh, with the Insider or Elite level packages. And also, really quickly, during the break, why don't you go on over to Midnight.fm, and that's where you can find out about all of our guests tonight. There are photos there. Uh, you'll see the photo there of all of the band members. If you just go to that, that will allow you to click over to the page that we've made for tonight's show with all the relevant links uh, to be able to follow along with them and their music, their websites, all of that so that you can keep up with everything going on. All right, we are going to take a break and then back with more Midnight Society here on Midnight FM. Society with Tim Weisberg on Midnight FN. And we are back more with our guests tonight. We are talking with John Bermuda Schwartz, Stephen Jay, and Ruben Valtiera. We're talking about the Weird Al band, and we're talking about the new book black and white and weird all over the lost photographs of weird Al Yankovic 83 to 86. And we were talking about how, you know, with this book, it's giving the fans an inside look and a chance to see some photographs that they've never seen before. And, and John, you were saying that, you know, these photographs are kind of, um, you know, just chronicling the entire rise of, of everything Weird Al and everything that you guys were doing, but it's also kind of, I would assume, chronicling the rise of your fandom as well and, and seeing the people who are buying every album, downloading every song, and going out there and seeing every tour. Well, it's... Um, I, uh, well, let's see, how do I... <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, first off, the book only only has... Uh, photographs th that are in town. So there are no live tour photographs. Though that's a separate set of photos. Those are all my color photos. <coughs> but <coughs> excuse me, you can see throughout the chapters, and as the time goes on, uh, that that it, it is growing. You can see that it is becoming. The videos are becoming more, more sophisticated. For example, from you know really hokey sort of bad, you know set of of a uh, of a house in uh, the valley in, in the LA area for the Ricky video to being on stage at MGM's Bally's Grand in Las Vegas with a bunch of the same uh showgirls that were in the Living in America video from James Brown uh you know from from going from one to the other in just 3 years so it does it does show that I mean, un unfortunately, you know what? I shot a lot of photos on the road, but never black and white. And the reason I didn't shoot black and white on the road is because we were in a different city each day. Uh, I couldn't really take my black and white film to a one-hour photo place. There was, you know, oh. there was no way. You know, to get that processed on the road would have taken till the next day, and we'd be gone. So all my color film, on the other hand, I developed as as we go along. I'd get them developed that day. I always got two sets of prints. I kept one set of print for for the archive. And the other set of prints, whoever was in those pictures got a copy of the picture. So it was it was an expensive proposition, you know, for me to shoot color on the road. 
but the black and white only represents the uh, the some of the videos and some of the studio stuff, and that was just sort of because it was inconvenient to do that on the road. So you're not see, you're not going to see any fans in in these things. Actually, there's some fans that appeared in some of the videos. You know, some of the friends who who wanted to be along for the ride and and you know uh, wanted a free lunch, I guess, or something. <laughs> but uh, you know, it it certainly documents what we did. And because I wasn't in the scenes in a lot of these videos. Uh, I had a lot of free time. You know, I, I was standing behind the camera, you know, behind the crew and off to the side and all that stuff, just kind of clicking away. So I was able to chronicle that stuff in a way that nobody else could. And and like I mentioned before, you know, because I'm the drummer, I guess if, if I was bothering anybody, they probably didn't want to say anything to me. They probably thought I was there, you know, because Al had asked me to be there. and He didn't really ask me to be there. I mean, yeah, they everyone appreciated eventually that I had photos of things that nobody else did. But at the time, I was able to chronicle things in a way that nobody else was, and it was it was really, uh, a, you know, an insider's look back inside, you know, an insider looking in, and uh, in, in, and I and I hope that's conveyed. I mean, people are seeing a lot of things that they would never normally see, you know, and there are no other counterparts to these photos. Uh, I was the only one with the camera at, at these events. Uh, I- there, of course, the questions are starting to roll in via email, Tim at midnight.fm, and they're coming in from some of the super fans. So the questions might get pretty deep. Uh, but I, I, I have a question. Do you still have the uh, Smells Like Nirvana t shirt that just says drummer? Yes, I do. Uh, I had to clean it. It was pretty sweaty by the end of that <laughs> night. But I, I have that shirt, and uh, I don't have the wig. I, I, uh, we use a different wig on tour, so I don't have that exact hair. But the shirt, yes. So, I mean, that was uh, certainly one of the, the quintessential videos of, of, of your career. And from what I understand, some of the cheerleaders were the ones from the original video. And, and of course, the janitor was the one from the original video. I mean, talk about trying to recreate, you know, the actual experience to be bringing in some of the original cast members from the Nirvana video like that. And we shot it in the same place that Nirvana shot theirs. We shot it on the same soundstage. Wow. Although I don't think Nirvana made anybody eat wet bagels. Uh, no, no, not, not, uh, yeah, not intentionally anyway. <laughs> that, that, I mean, that, that just goes to show though, that, um, you know, there's a, there's a level of, of commitment to the art of actually making a parody mean something. So it's not just as, as we were saying before, it's not making fun of a song. It's taking a song and utilizing it as a vehicle to tell a different story. That was one of the, the songs, though, that directly related to the band that it was talking about. Well, right, that the lyrics were, were a lot of kind of nonsense or just sort of mumbling, you know, or so, so we thought. I mean, there were actually lyrics to Smells Like Teen Spirit. You just couldn't really understand them, or, or at least as adults, we didn't understand it. Maybe the kids did. Uh, but, but the way he sang and some of the words that were put together, the way Kurt sang, uh, it, it just seemed that way. And that's, it, it seemed like you couldn't, you know, like it was slurred some of it. And that was what Al thought was funny. And that's, that's what he, uh, that's what he capitalized on. That's, that's what it became about, you know, and, and copying the video, you know, with, with a few obvious different types of gags in it, but copying the, the look and the feel and, and, uh, you know, that was that's important you know that's important when you're when you're going to do that sometimes the video has nothing to do with the original video had to do with i love rock and roll had nothing to do with you know joan jett being in or, or i love rocky road with joan jett being in a ice cream parlor you know ricky had nothing to do with mickey you know some other videos parodied the original video though very closely eat it was you know pretty close to beat it mm-hmm. you know with some extra funny stuff thrown in you know fat was pretty close to bad with a couple extra, you know, jokes thrown in and, and smells like Nirvana was pretty close to smells like teen spirit with the addition of some underarm hair on the cheerleaders, uh, Dick Van Patten in the cheer, <laughs> in the, in the stands having a good time, you know, stuff like that. Uh, Al cutting off his hair at the very end of it, you know? So, so as you said, you know, it, it's, it's some of the lyrics were hard to understand and I know it's hard to bargle Nargles out with all the marbles in your mouth. But is it true that it wasn't actually marbles when Al recorded it that he had a mouthful of cookies? Why well, I I don't know I don't I don't think I was there when he was doing his vocal. Steve, uh, were you there? Nope. Hmm. Well, that's uh don't don't know. Might just be I urban mean, urban. I, urban I wouldn't myth. put it past Al to put cookies in his mouth, but uh, I I don't know on that one. 
<laughs> well, let's ask some of these other questions that are coming in from some of the listeners. Uh, this one might be a little bit hard to answer because of everything that's going on in the world. Uh, but Vincent wants to know if there are any hints that you can give about any potential upcoming tours. Uh, all, all I can say is that we had a tour planned to start in January that had been planned a while ago. And that was, uh, postponed back in March by William Morris, who's the booking agency. And, uh, it remains to be seen when we'll get back out. You know, we'll, we'll see, uh, we're, we're hoping for the best. We would love to get out next year. And if it's at all possible, um, there's a good chance of that. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know. That's something we'll, we'll see what, uh, you know, February, March, April, you know, what, uh, what it looks like for the rest of the year at that time. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get past this. But it is good news that, you know, there were plans before, so hopefully they, they can be picked up. Uh, John, this question also comes in to you from Matt. Uh, he wants to know, when you're playing Beverly Hillbillies Live, which is one of my favorite parodies, uh, he wants to know, uh, the opening drums, those aren't live during during that performance? Uh, uh, no, that's on the video because that's just tied in with the song. Um, you know what, even, even Mark Knopfler didn't do the drums in the beginning dire straits didn't do that they just they'd go right into the song not that it's a hard part i i think uh i don't know i think they just wanted to get to the meat of it and we kind of do that we do that partly because the the film clip that comes out of that comes out of uh, a clip in the uhf movie where al sort of you know is, is dreaming off and dreaming that he's on stage and it leads into it in that way and it just it basically uh, you know we we decided at the time it wouldn't really make sense to try and play that whole intro when it's already there, when it's already integral, an integral part of the film, so that's why that stayed. So, and uh, and we just we just jump in. Actually, the guitars just jump in when it when the guitar hits. That's Jim. Then we're live. And from from what I understand, uh, again, this might be you know a little bit deeper into the to the Weird Al catalog than casual listeners might know. But so as much as I love that parody because it really came out of nowhere for me that it was going to be Beverly Hillbillies. But from what I understand, it was not Al's first attempt at turning the Beverly Hillbillies theme into a into a parody. That he actually he did it before with with the Rolling Stones way back in the day. Uh, yes, it was uh, it was called Beverly Hillbillies Miss You, and it was the Beverly Hillbillies lyrics to the Stones Miss You, you know, basically. And and uh, yeah, <laughs> so um, not not his first rodeo with uh, Jed and and uh, Granny and all of that. And, and Steve, do you feel like you guys need to stay up on the same cultural references uh, that are in the songs? Do you just kind of let Al handle that and he just kind of tells you, you know, what needs to come in? Or are you all just kind of, you know, interested in a lot of the same type of things? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by cultural references. Well, you know, like things that, you know, he'll he'll talk about old TV shows, things about food. I mean, are these things that interest you as well, or do you kind of just go along with whatever crazy references he comes up with? Uh, well, yeah, they're, they're, they're of interest. A lot of times I learn things, you know, that I didn't know about from working on songs that I was doing. You know, I'll find out about a lot of things that I wasn't aware of before. I mean, I, I, I know that, you know, for most people... Uh, the the food works, you know, lasagna, everybody knows lasagna and all that, but sometimes, you know, try, somebody comes at you and says, we're going to turn the, the Flintstone song into a red hot chili pepper, uh, into a red hot chili peppers version. I mean, that's kind of something that's a, a little bit out there. We have another question uh, that comes in from Matt. Uh, he says, since you're all such accomplished music, uh, accomplished musicians and you play so well together, has there ever been any consideration of working on full songs together as a band outside of working with Al. Go ahead, Steve. Um, not really. No. I think he just said he can hey, only, but, um, he can only stand you guys so much. Right. <laughs> no, uh, Oh, we've done a couple of little things, but, uh, not really any big projects. But if I could, uh, just getting back to John's book mm -hmm. for a minute. Mine arrived in the mail today, and it is spectacular. Oh, thank you. Such beautiful, cool. such beautiful reproductions. So rich. I mean, the 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 uh, lithography that went into the book is just first rate. 
And I was blown away with how heavy it was when I first picked it up. I'm like, this is, whoa, what is this? And it's like really big feeling. And, and with the images so, so large too, they, uh, they are just really, really fascinating. Bring back so many memories. So great job, John. Oh, well, th thanks. Not me, but the publisher. And, and they specialize like in pop culture art books. So, and that's exactly, you know, th that's exactly what this is. So yeah, they did a, they did a yeah. fabulous job on this. I'm, I'm really happy with it. And, and what was the process of, I, of that? Was it that you just gave them the photographs and then they come up with the design of how to put it out there? Or were you very actively involved in the design of, you know, what photographs would go where and what would work with what? No, I, well, I scanned uh, all the negatives to begin with, so we would have the cleanest possible ones. I retouched all of them that, that were, uh, I thought, print worthy or, you know, that weren't like, you know, that, that were usable in some way, you know, that either weren't too dark or weren't too light or weren't blurry or, or whatever. And I narrowed it down a little bit, cleaned up what was left, uh, ran them all by Al first to make sure we didn't put anything out that uh, he didn't like. I thought there were going to be a couple that, that he might go, eh, you know, could you, you know, not use that one? He approved every single one of them. And I submitted all of those to uh, the publisher, 1984 Publishing, out of Cleveland. And they, they went through and, and picked out the photos, and they did the layouts, and there was only there was literally one change I made, and I'll tell you what it is and why uh, to the layouts. Otherwise, they they put everything together. You know, the pictures they made big and the pictures they made smaller were all done properly, and the ones they chose were all the right ones. I don't think there was anything that I, I think should have been in there that didn't get in there. There was one change I made, and there's a picture in the I Love Rocky uh, Road chapter, and it's a picture of Al and the band and Doctor Demento uh, outstanding in their field next to a plane we we shot that video at a at a like a private airport and uh there was a plane out there so we <coughs> went up stood next to the plane took a couple of pictures actually musical mike took those two pictures and they originally had that as a, a sort of a small picture uh i think it was you know a half a page picture and i said you know that's that's a cool picture for a couple of reasons one it would look really good across two pages because it's a great you know, it's a nice shot, and it's framed in such a way so so that if somebody has that book and wants any of us to sign, you know, a particular page in the book, that's going to be the page. That's the one page where the whole band and Dr. Demento appear. That would be a great page. Let's make that picture a big picture, and whatever was the other, whatever it replaced could go somewhere else. But that one really deserves to be a, a big shot. That's an important picture for that reason. And they did that. That's literally the only change I made. Everything else they did, I, I was thrilled with. Um, I, they've just—they've done a great job. They've made this very, very easy, and they've—they've uh, they've, uh, fortunately this year, you know, I've, I've been doing virtually no playing, at least not with other humans, you know, live or dead humans. I mean, I play with dead humans would be great, but you know, it's just not happening. Uh, fortunately, the book was was well underway. This all got going last December, and uh, that's been keeping me kind of busy. And uh, uh, I wrote, uh, there's copy in the book, there's, there's text in the book that deals with the different chapters, but basically it's a picture book. And there was, uh, it's, I had, you know, somebody asked the question about, did I keep the uh, drummer shirt from the Nirvana video? So, so there was, you know, normally we, we might be able to keep or, or steal certain props, certain things, you know, we can just kind of run out with or, or that, you know, were made for us and nobody else wants them. And I, I cite one of the references in the Eat It chapter. Uh, one of the dancers, actually the, the lead dancer of, of one of the gangs, who was also in the Beat It video, who was also in several other and, and did choreography for other Michael Jackson and Madonna videos, Vincent Patterson. Uh, he told me, I was asking him some questions about that, just to put together some text, and he says, uh, you know, I still have the rubber chicken. <laughs> so that's that's kind of and that's something that I probably would have stolen at the time, you know, if if uh, I thought about it, if he hadn't nabbed it first. So that's one of those little sort of anecdotes that are in there. But primarily, it's a photo book. Now Al wrote the foreword also for the from the book for the book. It's uh, and it's very heartfelt and it's very sort of funny and it's very Al. Uh, the, the the publisher saw that and he says I, that's that's the best foreword I've ever read. Wow. So. So that was uh, 
Uh, we didn't touch that. A lot of my text, you know, things got massaged and a couple of people proofread it and just made sure I was saying the right thing in the right way and punctuated properly. Like I learned when you're using numbers, when you're referring to a number, uh, you spell it out. Like, you know, I, I, I have been playing drums for seven years. You would literally write S-E-V-E-N rather than the number seven. I mean, that's, that's the proper way to do it. Yes, we accept it if we see a seven. But I've started incorporating that in emails and, and posts online and stuff like that. I've started writing things out, unless it's a, a dollar amount or something like that. But, you know, if, if you're describing something like a quantity, you, you spell it out. You write it out. So that's, that's something kind of cool that I learned, and, and that's just, you know, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shove that down everyone's throat now. <laughs> All right, well, we are going to take our final break of the night, and when we come back on the other side, we will have more, our final segment with our guests tonight, and I've got more really inside deep stuff, Weird Al band questions coming your way from some of the fans who are all tuning in. Thank you to all of them for coming into the uh, Midnight Society here tonight. This is what we do each night. We like to talk about the kind of things that you can only hear here on Midnight FM, and it's a network that we created ourselves to be able to talk about the things that we want to talk about. And you can catch this program, Midnight Society, each and every weeknight from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. Eastern Time. Normally, we cover a lot of paranormal topics, but not always. Uh, we have all kinds of uh, fun here on the program. And the basic rule that I gave my producer, Michelle, is when it comes to booking guests, I just want to have fun and talk about cool things. So that is what we do here. And if you like the program, you can go to midnight.fm, sign up there for a membership, and get access to all of our previous show archives. By the way, our music here on Midnight Society is from Matt Sharp and the Rentals. Matt Sharp, of course, formerly of Weezer, which you all know recently performed with Weird Al. So we'll be back with more Midnight Society in just a few moments here on Midnight FM. Back with our final segment of tonight's edition of Midnight Society here on Midnight FM. We are talking with John Bermuda Schwartz, Stephen Jay, and Ruben Valtiera of the Weird Al Band. We're talking uh, not only about their careers and about their work, uh, we're also talking about the new book, which is called Black and White and Weird All Over, The Lost Photographs of Weird Al Yankovic, 83 to 86. And if you want to be able to pick that up for yourself, all you have to do is go to midnight.fm. All the links are right there for tonight's show so that you can pick up that. And you can also follow along with all of these guys online. You can uh, order Steve's CD that's coming up. You can uh, watch uh, Ruben's Facebook videos, uh, his live stream that he does. Uh, that's all going to be right there. Everything that you need right there at midnight.fm and you can access everything right through there uh and I'll, I'll try and get to as many of these questions that are coming in as i can and as i mentioned before some of them are going to be <laughs> pretty deep uh but i will say before we get into that nancy just wanted me to thank uh the three of you guys and also jim as well who we've, we've been having trouble connecting with but to thank you all for the music that you have given over the years and for making everybody laugh but also kind of just making them feel good about the music that uh, that you have been creating all these years Oh, thank, that's lovely to hear. Thank you. And let's see if I can uh, bring up some of these questions. And, and as I said, some of these are going to be kind of deep and some of them are going to be <laughs> kind of weird, uh, but that's all right. That's what we're looking for uh, here tonight. We like the weird. So this question comes from Jimmy 
Uh, Jimmy says, in Al's close personal friends Facebook group, we were discussing how and or why Joe Dirt got such a bad rap in the song Close But No Cigar. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts on, on why Al took a dig at Joe Dirt in the lyrics of that song? That's what no. I thought. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just one of those things that probably sounded good. I'm, I'm sure if he's anything like the rest of us, he knows that Joe Dirt is a Hollywood film masterpiece. So, and if he doesn't, yeah, that's it. if that's he doesn't want to talk into that microphone, I got another microphone right here for him. All right. Let's uh, see what else is coming in here uh, via emails. Uh, so this again, as I mentioned, very deep. Uh, this question is for Bermuda. Uh, this comes from Dustin. Is the song Everything You Know Is Wrong in the same category as Hardware Store and Genius in France for being a song likely to not be played live in concert? If is there any? If not, is there any particular reason why it's not made a set list yet? Uh, I it wouldn't be it wouldn't be hard to play live. Uh, I mean, the problem with doing Hardware Store is is lyrically, and particularly that whole section in the middle. It's just lyrically, there's no way we could do the song in the way it appears on the album. Uh, if we were to do that, it would have to be a completely different thing. Uh, I mean, and and then is that better or is that cool or is you know, come on, you guys aren't playing the song the way we like it. So you know, there's certain things you just don't do. Genius in France is uh, is is very intricate, intricate musically and vocally, and uh, you know that would also I I don't, it's not something we could really do justice. You know, uh, Zappa and his band could do that stuff. You know, we're, we're not quite, you know, that's, it's a little more difficult for us. Um, everything, you know, is wrong is certainly a doable song. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know why we haven't done that. Well, so there you go. Maybe that will make it on to the forthcoming potential tour. If we ever can get back to those tours. Uh, there's also a question that has come in. Uh, this comes, uh, the question is, is there anywhere you can get a physical copy of the Al's band CD? Yes, Steve. Steve, you have that uh, that info still. I think. Oh yeah, yeah. I still have some copies. So they can they just order them from my website. Yep, just go to your website, which is uh, it's linked up at midnight fm, or you can go to Stephen J J A Y Stephen J Stephen with a ph uh, dot com. So it's uh, linked up right at midnight fm. If you go there, you'll be able to get over there as well. Uh, Ruben, I want to ask you a question. I, I got to you, talk to to, to, to Tim. Jo- Tim Ruben left. Sorry. Oh, he okay. <laughs> I understand he, you know, doing your own show and then coming on to this one. It's a lot to talk in one night. I understand. Uh, well, I was going to ask about the performances, but Steve, I'll ask you the same question about having to be, you know, not only the bass player in the band, but also to be part of, you know, I talked about this with John earlier, part of the video, being a character, uh, being part of the stage performance. Is is that something that you you know, that you enjoy the, the part of also kind of having to be a bit of an actor as well as being a musician in, in some of these performances. Oh yeah. I enjoy it very much. It's really fun. Really fun. What, what's probably the craziest thing that you've had to do in your tenure with, with the band? Well, we went pretty crazy in those chili pepper outfits, you know, <laughs> yeah. during the yep. bed rock anthem. Uh, I mean, I can remember one night at Toad's Place in uh, New Haven where we were really uh, lifting everybody off their feet. You know, that's a song where we we could really go nuts and uh, have a lot of fun. But yeah, it's kind of like being in a a play at times. You know, it's kind of like being in a play about the music that you're playing, you know, so you you enjoy um, exploring the character of you know, for me, the bass player in the band that we're doing, I, I get a lot of pleasure out of it. And, you know, and, and that's not, that's, that couldn't have been an easy song to, to be able to do either. Cause you, you know, flea is a pretty complex bass player. Uh, and I know that you're, you're fantastic too, but I mean, was it hard to kind of play in that same style? Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, I guess the only difficult thing in that part is that you're sliding up pretty far, maybe an octave and a half to that high note, you know, every fourth beat or so, boom, boom, doo, 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 and just making a nice clean slide where you land on it is always, uh, 
a thing sort of in and of itself, you know, it keeps you entertained. You're not just staying in one position with your hand, you know, where you can um, basically uh, know where you are just because your hand's not moving. But with that much neck movement, it makes it very physical to play, and you definitely have to stay on top of it, you know. Uh, so it's not hard, but it's it's one of those things like, that you enjoy doing it like in a sport or something. It's, I suppose it's hard, you know, if you look at it from the outside, but while you're doing it, it feels more just like, you know, having pure fun. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you guys actually had to paint yourselves in the video like the chili peppers did too, right? Well, somebody painted us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. That was a really, run really fun video to shoot. You know, we got there before sunrise and, watched the sun come up over the desert and did the whole thing until sunset where we shot that last scene. That was a really gorgeous day. What, what, what was probably your favorite video, Steve, of all the, of all the ones that you've done? Uh, shooting the video, you mean? Yeah. And being able to perform in it. and. Oh, okay. Well, gosh, they were all so much fun. Gump was a blast splashing around in that fountain and uh, of course Amish Paradise was super fun having my kids there being doing their part and uh, yeah and uh, living with a hernia what a trip that was and they're all, they've all been uh, really fun and and how about yourself John uh, you know is there any that any experiences that stand out more than some of the others I I would agree with all of those I would add uh, smells like Nirvana was a lot of fun um, you know, on, uh, like, you know, although we're a four piece band at, at that time, you know, Nirvana being a three piece band, when we shot the video, uh, you know, Al did not stick Jim in there. Uh, you know, Al put on the guitar and, uh, you know, Steve was, uh, was, I forgot their bass player's name. Um, uh, Chris Novoselic. Uh, uh, right, right, right. Steve was him. I was Dave Grohl, you know, and, and that was it. Now, Steve, uh, Jim did get a little cameo. He got a little walk on you know, just so he would be in it. But, you know, Al didn't shove him in there. Al was very true to the original, you know, lineup uh, as, as much as possible. You know, in the same way with living with a hernia, you know, where there wasn't necessarily a, a band, you know, because there were horn players, he had other guys in there playing horns. I mean, he made it look like it was supposed to look. Uh, all of the videos were fun. I mean, whether I got to be in them a lot or whether I was kind of standing off to the side taking a lot of photos, uh, they, they were all fun. I mean, Amish paradise was fun. I mean, just anywhere where we can sort of get, get made up and be someone completely different, you know, the wig and smells like Nirvana, the beard in Amish paradise, you know, the, the silver paint and the horns on my head in, in, uh, bedrock anthem, you know, that's interesting being a black and white video. I have rolls and rolls of film of color shots of that. And some of those pictures have been seen, but a lot of them haven't. So you see all the silver paint on us and stuff. And, uh, yeah, live, you know, when we were doing that song live, we had, uh, you know, the caveman outfits that we wore. I had a hat that I put on a la Chad Smith, but they had built some horns into it. So I, I'd have the horns like he had in the video or like I had in the video. Um, they're all fun. Anytime we can do that stuff, you know, it's just, it's, it's fun. Anytime we can sort of perform, whether it's musically or, or physically, you know, on stage, it's fun. It's, it's a good time. You know, if it wasn't fun, I, you know, I would ask for more money, but it is fun. So I'm, I'm, I'm good. You know, I'm good with it. Well, I, I know now there's, there seems to be more of an emphasis on, on animated videos, uh, because it, it, you know, it's easier to get those out. And, and I, and I assume that, you know, there's, there's probably less involvement in having to get everybody together all in the same place. And it's, it's easier to put that out. Do you feel like maybe, and this isn't just a, in terms of your own band, but just kind of the, the industry in general, are, are music videos becoming less and less important for promoting the songs? No, they're, they're still important, you know, despite the fact that MTV is, you know, hasn't been a music video channel for a long time. Uh, you know, there's YouTube and, and other, and people's, uh, you know, other video streaming, uh, outlets, you know, whether it's Twitter or Instagram or on Facebook, there's other places where, where the visual can be seen. And yes, it's, it's very important. You know, it's, that's become an important thing as far as the animated stuff. Uh, you know, Al can, can create things and, and have things created with animation that can't really be done with live people. You know, certainly there's the coordination and the logistics and, and frankly, the expense of it all. 
But there's a lot of cool things you can do with animation that just don't translate if you put live people in there. You know, whether whether he's being seen as an animated character or not. You know, like the word crimes video. I don't think I don't think any of us are portrayed in that video. You know, it's it's strictly a visual thing. But that's cool. It suits it perfectly. One one of the things that I found to be most impressive and and I don't know how it came together so fast, but after the first debate between President Trump and Joe Biden, for him to have the parody and the video and all of that come out so quickly, it was it was incredible. I mean, all I could think of is how did they put that out in a matter of hours? Uh, you know, that that's a question for Al. Yeah, that was a very fast turnaround. I mean, it was it was like 12 or 14 hours later. I mean, it was out pretty fast the next day. Uh, and it was well, it wasn't a, a slip shot thing. It was well done. It was well produced. Um, I don't know. You know what? That's a question for Al one of these I'm, days. I'm just going to throw out the conspiracy theory there. Everybody was worried that, you know, Joe Biden was getting stuff fed to him and, and all this kind of stuff. I think maybe what was actually happening is they were sending a direct monitor to Al so he could start writing that song. So that's, <laughs> that's who was, uh, you know, in the, in the earpiece that people claim that they saw. It was just weird Al being like, here's the lyrics that I wrote. Try and work this into the debate. That's <laughs> That's my honestly, I, I don't know if Al wrote the, the lyrics for that. I don't know. You know, the Gregory brothers put that together and they had done one a couple of years ago uh, with the Hillary and, and Trump debate as well. That Al sort of was was kind of the moderator in that uh, video that didn't come out quite as quickly as this one did, though. No, I, I uh, you know, hats off to all of them for turning it around that fast. I mean, that was that was an all nighter and then some. Now, looking back, at, at, at going, you know, going through the book and looking through those photographs, uh, and and seeing the progression of, you know, the 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 experience, uh, can you see the way that things changed? It the way it went from being, you know, a group of guys playing those college shows to to these bigger productions of some of these music videos. Uh, when you look back at it, do you think to yourself like that, that's a pretty unique, you know? opportunity to 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 go from that to this mega stardom uh you know playing you know funny songs well as as i pointed out you know you can really tell in the first chapter the ricky video the first video uh how sort of hokey and low budget that i mean and, and that's not to say it was a bad video it was a great video yeah. but it was pretty simple and and certainly low budget uh even at the time even in 1983 uh to just three years later, three and a half years later, living with a hernia on stage with showgirls and lights and, you know, it was a, a big deal. You know, you could, you could sort of see it, you know, progress in there. You know, I, I wish, uh, well, I do have photos of other video shoots and stuff like that. But, you know, this, this is a very narrow period of just black and white and they haven't been seen. And, you know, that's, that's the purpose of this book is it's really out there being seen for the first time. But you get a hint of it. You can see it growing. You can see... You know, if if only that our video budget was obviously growing, uh, you know, that became apparent. You know, the more crew people you would see around uh, and and in the case of living with the hernia, the fact that we were on a big stage that we had gone in and rented, you know, a, a, a Vegas stage for a day, you know. So, yeah, you can you can see it in there. You can tell. I, I, I mean, I'll always love the Ricky video, uh, of course, seeing that on TV. Uh, that's when I first knew what Dr. Demento looked like. My dad said, Hey, that's Dr. Demento in the video. And I was like, the guy at the top hat, that's Dr. Demento. <laughs> I was like, that's actually kind of appropriate when you think about it. But yeah, so that was kind of my exposure to that. So, I mean, I, I was looking at some of the photos that are on the Amazon page for the book and it looks like it answers the question that I've always had about that video. So Al did shave his mustache off for that video. Yes. Yes. That, and I have pictures of him. I, I, I was everywhere with the camera. I just, I was, I was shameless and Al didn't stop me. So I just kept clicking away. I have pictures of him, color photos of him shaving off his mustache, uh, in, in the bathroom in the house, you know, first he cuts it with the scissors to get it down. And then, and then you see him with a shaving cream and, uh, you know, one or two of those has been published. I think they're on weirdal.com from way, 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 way back. Uh, but I've, I've got photos of that, you know, and yes, he absolutely, uh, you know, one of the few times when he did, when his trademark mustache was always on, it was one of two times I can remember that he shaved it off. Even at times when he could have shaved it off, like for the fat video or for Eat It or for any of the other 
videos where, you know, he was parodying someone and they didn't have a mustache. You know, he could have, but that's his look. Same with the glasses. His look was the glasses and the mustache because he needed glasses and he, and he wore a mustache. But there was one other time he shaved the mustache. We had in maybe 1998 or something like that, we had shot some sort of fake promo, like unplugged, Al unplugged promo video stuff for uh, MTV or VH1. And they were just us going through some songs as if we had done an unplugged show. And we hadn't. I mean, we just were basically doing these things to cook up these little 60-second promos. And Al had shaved off his mustache for that and put on a wig. And, of course, I got photos of that. And uh, so those are the only two times when he had a mustache that he shaved them off. And then uh, when he lost the glasses... Uh, he, he lost the mustache for the most part. Now you see him with and without it, but he went for a cleaner look, uh, let his hair grow longer. And, uh, you know, that became Al's look, you know, for a while, but it's funny, but you know, a lot of people, when they think of weird Al, they think of that classic look, you know, the glasses and the mustache, you know, there was a Chia pet weird Al that was just released in the last month or two. And it's the classic Al it's, it's the glasses and the mustache and a Hawaiian shirt and, and, uh, and the chia stuff, it actually works. I grew mine, and it actually works. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's absolutely true, though. It was such a change when when he did change up his look that people were like, oh, my God, Like, is that even the same guy? I remember my girlfriend at the time said, oh, I never realized Weird Al's a good-looking guy. <laughs> but it's because he was he was kind of playing up that, that goofy image, right? That's uh yeah, I guess. I mean, I, you know, you put glasses and curly hair on anyone, and I guess they, they look like a nerd. I don't know. Uh, but he just, he had he had a look, and, and you know, that was his look. And, and when he changed it, you know, people accepted the new look, but they didn't let go of the old one. You know, it's, it's uh, like John Lennon, you know, when you saw him in glasses, even though he wore glasses as a Beatle a bit, you know, when, when he was wearing glasses full time, you know, in the 70s, uh, you know, that... That became the new look. That became him. But you still, you know, remember the old John, the mop top, you know, 1964 John Lennon, you know, so it, it worked for him both ways. Yep. I mean, I, I will, I forever, you know, if somebody says to me, Weird Al, and I close my eyes, I just, I picture the, the dare to be stupid cover, you know, of him staring into the fisheye lens, you know, like that, that to me yeah. is, is, uh, you know, that'll always be the classic Weird Al to me. But again, you know, being being a, a chameleon in performance and being a chameleon in your physical appearance, it all kinds of, you know, fits together. Uh, one of the, the things that I'm most looking forward to about this book is getting to see, you know, what it's like behind the scenes. Because from what I understand and what I've been told, Al's very much a perfectionist. And so that means that everybody around him has to also kind of rise up to that level. It sounds like it's natural for the band uh, because you all want to play at the highest level that you can. But do other people that come into the orbit of what it is that you all do, uh, are they surprised by the level of commitment that they have to have to making things exactly right? Steve? Yes. Yeah, I would say so. <laughs> so even... Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, without it's, naming any specific people, we've had people come into the situation of filling in for uh, a band member or else joining us on stage, and they usually have to um, adjust their thinking, you know, because it's a unique way of doing things, the way Al does things, and uh, you don't find it where I haven't found it in any other ensemble in any other band that I've ever worked in before. Yeah, I, I think people don't expect it because you think, well, it's just comedy and it's it's not serious, but it's it's quite serious. I mean, he's he's you know, uh, he's not you know, Al's not a taskmaster, but he wants things done his way and he's right in the way he wants them. And and uh, you know, he's been lucky. I think we were all pretty much perfectionists in what we did, and and that's why mm -hmm. this band has stayed together the, the way it has. You know, we were all on board before Al even had to tell us, you know, uh, how to do it, you know, and to do it right. We knew that. You know, we were, we were already there and, you know, in the beginning, maybe people didn't know that maybe they were surprised to see that side of him. I think that reputation has come out though over the years and people appreciate that he is a good producer, that he is a good director, that he is a good craftsman, that he's very meticulous about lyrics and parts and, you know, the, and the stage show. I mean, he completely controls that stage show. Every bit of video you see is he has put together. Uh, he, he has produced that if something runs a little bit long or he, you know, finds at the beginning of a tour that a certain thing isn't getting much of a laugh, 
you know, and it's just taking, and it just looks stupid. Uh, he'll take it out. The next day, it's gone. He just handles that all himself, and the timing down to the second. And he's just, he's very, uh, he's very meticulous that way. But it, it's, it's a good thing. He doesn't overdo it. He does what needs to be done. And that's something you don't always find in a lot of artists. You know, they're willing to let things just sort of be what they are. And, and then there's others that are Steely Dan, you know, and, and Paul McCartney and, you know, Frank Zappa. You know, they want things exactly the way they want them. And, and you do that or, or you're out. And, and Al is that way. You know, Al is very much... You know, he's, he's in that vein, but he's very nice about it. He's very good about it. Well, I mean, I know that it's work and, and I know that there is, you know, that level of commitment to being able to put everything together and to be able to create what it is that you're all able to create. But I'll, I'll ask each of you this, Steve is for you. Is it, is it always fun to go to work or are there some days when you're like, oh man, like, I don't know if I can get myself into this mindset today. No, it's always fun it's definitely always the politics of ecstasy. You know, sometimes you have to hide how much fun it is. You know? <laughs> if you have too much fun, they'll be like, well, I think we're just going to make your paycheck a little bit less this week because you had a lot of fun. <laughs> well, what it is, is like, uh, you know, gosh, some of these shows we do are just so mind, mind bendingly soul stirring. When you stand out in some of these arenas and you have this experience with an audience, and then you do it the next night and the next night and the next night. It's like, um, you know, a major force of nature to be reckoned with, um, psychologically just, it, it's, it's, uh, it's way, way beyond fun. You know, it, it gives you a sense of, uh, that maybe you're, you know, being of good use on, on this planet, you know, and what you're doing is, is helping people. It's, it's, it's super heavy. Yeah, I mean, has there has there ever been a bad show, John? Has there ever been a night where you said, "Gee, it just doesn't seem like things are, are really working overall"? I mean, I know that you said you know bits and pieces might not go over as well as others, but I can't imagine there's ever a bad night to to be in the Weird Al band. I don't, I don't. From the band's perspective, no, uh, we're we're pretty consistent. We're pretty consistently great, <laughs> honestly. If we have a bad, you know, if we're not up to snuff, that means we've only delivered 99 percent that night uh if there's any kind of if there's anything weird we feel from the show it's maybe that the audience isn't quite you know quite there and that's really really rare that maybe they don't they they're not as enthusiastic as as the night before and there's sometimes audiences are extremely enthusiastic and i mean it's really it's it's a team sport i mean we really we're not just up there playing for our own enjoyment we're playing for the fans and and there's definitely a dynamic there's definitely when they're loving it you can tell and not just by the length of the applause or that you know you can just there's an energy there's really an energy that you that you feel that you get by being up there and and it feeds us on stage i mean it feeds me you know i certainly you know would rather play for i'd rather play for a hundred ecstatic fans than, you know, 10,000 ones who are just there because they got free tickets at night or something, for example. I mean, you know, and, and who don't want to be there, you know, so it's not the size of the audience at all. It's just, it's their level of energy. And we definitely, we, we feel that, you know, and when they've got a good energy, it's that much better for us. And when they don't have a good energy, we're still pretty good. You know, we still, we still enjoy it, but it's even better when the, when the fans are there with us. And it's a family show. I mean, uh, when the world returns to normal and the band does go out on tour, I highly recommend that everybody goes out and sees them. Uh, but until then, of course, they have the videos that they can watch and they can listen to the music. And, of course, more importantly than anything, they can pick up the book Black and White and Weird All Over, The Lost Photographs of Weird Al Yankovic, 83 to 86. Uh, while we were talking, John, uh, during the course of this show, Amazon has gone temporarily out of stock. But uh, I'm sure as we get closer, you know, to the, you know, the, the date that they said they were going to move it to, but then they didn't have to. I'm sure there'll be more in stock. But uh, it just goes to show how much people really want to get their hands on this book. Well, that's I'm very pleased. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, both of you. And uh, give my thanks to Ruben and even to Jim, even though we couldn't make it happen. We'll definitely have to uh, have you guys all back on again sometime, maybe when there's a, a new album to talk about or, or a new tour coming out. Cool. That'd be thank great, you, Tim. Jim. Thank right. you, Tim. Thank you, guys. Uh, take care and be well. All right. Thanks. Good night. All right.
And everybody out there, thank you all for tuning in, especially all of you Weird Al fans who are tuning in for the first time. Hopefully you enjoyed the experience. Uh, I want to say that uh, this has been one of my absolute favorite radio shows that I've ever gotten the chance to do, talking to people that made a difference in my life. Uh, as I wrote about in the, um, in the Telepath newsletter today from the Paranormal Radio app, uh, which you can go to paranormal.radio and you can read those articles. But uh, as I mentioned, you know, the music of these guys changed my life, changed the course of who I am. Let me know it's okay to be weird. It's okay to have fun and be goofy and to make up your own words to songs. And it's okay to talk about that with other people. And because of Dr. Demento, I learned it's okay to want to bring that to the radio. You can be weird on the radio. And uh, if not for them, I probably never would have gone down the path that I went down to that led me to Art Bell and paranormal stuff and all of that. So it was very much one of the building blocks that made me the weird guy that I am. That's why when I say that we're all weirdos here and some of you get offended when I use that term, you shouldn't be. It is the biggest term of endearment I think you can give to anybody because a weirdo means that you're not so worried about just being like everybody else, that you are your own person, that you look at things your own way and that you are willing to say, you know what? I know that I might get a funny look from somebody or I know that somebody might judge me a little bit differently because of this, but I don't care because I'm going to be true to who I am. And I think that that stands out in this music and that stands out in the way that the Weird Al band performs. And I know that you'll get that feeling when you get to see behind the scenes and some of those photographs as well. All right, that'll do it for tonight's show. We'll be back tomorrow night. Mark Dawidziak joins us to talk about some of the best in horror. So I will talk to you then. Stay tuned for Fright Day. And until tomorrow night. In the words of Warren Zevon, enjoy every sandwich. There's a lot of Weird Al references I could have made there. <laughs>